Hi everyone, my name is Ron Livne. I'm the Director General of the Ramon Foundation. We're thrilled to have you with us at the Skycom Con 2021. We have fascinating evening ahead of us. So good evening, good night, Israel and Europe. Uh, good morning, the US, uh, North America, and uh, good night, uh, uh, Australia. Um, this is actually Sunday. Sunday in Israel, it's the first day of the week. So this is the first uh, week of the, the first day of the Israeli uh, uh, Space Week, which is dedicated to these seven people, uh, the brave member of the STS-107 uh, uh, crew who perished in the Columbia STS-107 uh, disaster. And Ilan Ramon, the first Israeli astronaut, was one of them. And uh, we are the Ramon Foundation, and we're named after him. Uh, it's basically a week, not of commemoration, of, but of celebration. Uh, we celebrate space, education, and science and technology. It was the vision of this woman, Rona Ramon, to commemorate these guys uh, by celebrating science and, and uh, uh, technology. And uh, she always said, look at these guys, the seven people, th these seven astronauts, and uh, think about the fact that when di they died, when they left us, they were smiling. Uh, so her goal was to see the reflection of the smile on the faces of adults and children. So we have a week full of, uh, uh, of events. And this is one of our fav my favorite ones, uh, simply because we have such a diverse uh, speakers today uh, from all over the world that's going to talk about science communication and the science communication role in our lives. Um, when I came to the Ramon Foundation five and a half years ago, when people would tell me science communication, I would have thought about inspiration and education. Uh, but nowadays, at least at the last four years or so, I think that with social media, and with all the things that are happening in the world, uh, science communication became much more important than it was. Uh, from a point that meant to do mainly inspiration and education, today we need to be more exact on our facts and actual to defend science some, sometimes against some sort of conspiracies. So tonight we have a special uh, a, a, a conference uh, with lots of speakers and uh, we we'll I would like, just like before we're starting, to say thank you to all of those who participated in organizing this event, especially Ron Sparkman, uh, Wade Holler, Med Melody Corman, uh, our partners from Explore Mars, Stardom, Fun Fact Science, and especially uh, this guy over here, uh, Kofi Rose, that basically pulled everything together here. And two special thanks all for, also for Donald James, the former NASA head of education, and to astronaut Garrett Raithman, who uh will share their knowledge with us uh, today to, uh, today so i just wanted to wish you all a happy conference and a great time and i'm sure it will be inspiring as hell ron back to you for our first session tonight i'd like to introduce former nasa astronaut garrett reisman uh, to talk about his personal connection to psychom um Originally from New Jersey, Dr. Reisman obtained advanced degrees in mechanical engineering from Caltech before being selected as a NASA mission specialist in 1998. Um, Garrett has flown aboard the space shuttles Endeavour, Discovery, uh, Atlantis, and spent over 107 days in space aboard and also just outside the International Space Station. Since returning to Earth, Garrett has held senior positions at SpaceX and is now a professor of uh, astronautical engineering at the University of South California. Garrett, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, my pleasure. It's great. To, it's great to be with all of you all over the world. It's really cool. One of the most incredibly important parts about science communication is the idea of communicating not only the science itself, but the ideas behind it, the ideas of critical thinking of how we interpret information. Now, uh, Garrett, I'm sure that you've noticed in recent times as well, we've been seeing this creeping into our everyday lives and into political life. I mean, there are some conspiracies that might appear as being somewhat harmless, but what do you think are some of the more uh, troubling aspects of the spread of misinformation and the lack of science communication? Yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely getting more and more alarming. Uh, I remember it's always been with us. I mean, conspiracy theorists are nothing new. It goes back centuries. Um, but uh, in, in, when I first became an astronaut in the early days, it was mostly centered around people who thought that um, the moon landing was a hoax, uh, you know, and that we never actually went to the moon and it was all on a soundstage in Hollywood. Ironically, by the way, it's really funny. I'm working on a uh, TV show now called For All Mankind. It's on Apple TV and where we have a soundstage in Hollywood where we fake moon landings. And I can tell you, it's really hard. And, and I'm the technical advisor, so it's my job to try to get it as realistic as we can. And we still mess it up all the time. And I, I keep telling the, the producers on the show 
that uh, I will be very happy when people notice that we did something wrong. I, I hope that we make some egregious mistake, that we have something that's completely technically incorrect and that people notice it. And by the way, that has happened. Uh, and uh, and I can say, so that I could just, I, I said, I'm all ready with the tweet. I'm going to say, see, even in 2021, we still, with all of our fancy visual effects that we have now and all of our computer technology and green screens and everything we have, we still can't fake a moon landing, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so it, 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 you know, I used to find it kind of humorous, these people that thought that it was all a hoax and that it was fake. Uh, I used to find, I was like, oh, isn't that kind of cute? And I used to almost take it as um, a compliment because it told me that people, that what we did back in, in 1968 when we, uh, or sorry, 69, when we landed uh, two men on the moon was so difficult to to digest and so hard to believe that people are still having a hard time wrapping their head around this, this uh, technological feat that was, you know, borderline miraculous. I mean, it is pretty unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, do you but, think? Do you think maybe? Sorry. Yeah, but I was, but, so, but the problem is now. Uh, so I, I used to take it. I, I also almost take it as a compliment. But the problem is now it's kind of it's really gotten out of control. Where there's so many different conspiracy theories now, in in in, in space exploration field, it's you know there's conspiracy theories that people think the Earth is flat. Uh, and you know that NASA is completely a, 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 a government conspiracy, and that we didn't do any of these things. And and it and and the problem is it's even creeping over, and and it's becoming very prevalent in our political domain because, and this is also not necessarily a new thing, but a lot of our political leaders are realizing that they can derive a lot of power and control over the population and political power by by convincing people that their opinion is fact when it's not, and. And this is a very corrosive and dangerous thing. I mean, the big lie uh, that politicians use to control and, and do terrible, terrible things. I mean, it's it's, it's what Hitler did, is what Stalin did. This this is not this is not a new thing, but it's but it's, it's becoming more and more prevalent in democracies, and and that is a scary scary thing. So I no longer think it's cute. I think uh, what you're, the points that you're raising are incredibly uh, incredibly prevalent, especially nowadays. Do you think, though, that there are certain things that, you know, uh, you've been able to do uh, in your career at NASA or NASA in general? Maybe there's been a switch in the mindset to kind of make these unbelievable things that, that are kind of disconnected from people's everyday lives more accessible, more, more, more humanized. Yeah. I, and so that is a good thing. So, so I, I think that we have done a better job of reaching out uh, to a, a large segment of the population and communicating in 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 uh, less than esoteric terms, uh, being able to communicate to a lay audience uh, what we're doing and why it's important, you know, uh, and 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 that's great, and, and and we're getting much more savvy about it, and, I, and part of it I I think started uh, in, in at least in the space business, you know, part of it was started at SpaceX with the webcast we were doing, where we're very entertaining and 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 focused on communicating. Uh, you know, don't use acronyms. Don't uh, don't let terminology be an obstacle to communicating the basic facts. And and uh, and 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 NASA has gotten much better at it too. If you look at NASA broadcasts, they're they're much more entertaining uh, than than they used to be. And that's a good thing. But along the way, we have to make sure that we don't dumb down the science and the fact, uh, and that we still uh, still uh, communicate the the most important essence of what we're doing. And 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 the and the and the and the scientific uh, investigation that's its foundation. So it's a, good, it's a good thing that you bring up the scientific essence, because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the way that, you know, you mentioned that you consult on a, For All Mankind on a sci-fi show that, you know, describes this um, kind of future that we didn't really experience exactly uh, with humans living uh, full time on the moon. Um, tell me, what do you think is, uh, you know, the importance of, of the relationship between science and science fiction? How accurate do things need to be? What are the real benefits from science fiction? Uh, well, you know, it, it it really the the benefit of science fiction is in its ability to inspire and and um, imagine a future that we can then go off and create. Because before you could just go ahead and 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 develop a new technology or a new tool, uh, somebody first has to imagine it, uh, what it looks like, what it could do. Uh, so there is this creative element uh, that. Uh, that that is necessary before we do anything that's truly um, innovative. Uh, 
uh, in, in, in the world of engineering and technology development. Uh, so a lot of times that, that innovative spark comes from fiction. And, you know, uh, you know, whether that be Jules Verne, who thought that, you know, we can we can launch people into space from Florida. That would be a good place to do it. He, he, he put that in a, in a novel way before anybody started breaking ground at uh, Cape Canaveral. Right. So so somebody and, and another great example is 2001, a space odyssey where Kubrick uh, put in there uh, astronauts using this crazy tablet to that they would be able to touch. And, 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 and it was like a computer screen that was mobile and, and, and you could hold it like a book. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, ended up now we have iPads. And, and so, so a lot of times the, the, the things that you see, uh, in, in fiction and, and whether that be in literature and in movies eventually end up being the, uh, inspiration that for the engineers to actually make it real and, and actually, uh, turn it into real things. So, and, and vice versa. Cause so I, you know, the, the, the person that was the creator of this show for all mankind, he also created Battlestar Galactica, the new reboot that you, you might have watched that series and he came to my launch uh on the space shuttle and he talked about how he felt like he was coming full circle because he was originally inspired to do the fiction and the work on star trek that he worked on before Battlestar galactica because he was inspired by what he saw in the apollo program and he's and, and so so science exploration fact inspired him to create better fiction and then the fiction inspired us to do better jobs so there's definitely a uh, an interplay there, which is very interesting. I think you're 100 percent right, and that interplay between science fiction and and actual science and the way that it influences society is incredibly important. But to get to that point, to get to the point where you have uh, scientists who are you know willing to to consult on films and TV shows, you need to have science communicators. So, what do you see as the most critical uh, way that we can use social media better as science communicators? I think I think one of the most important messages to get out there, and, and I think again, again, going back to this um, this this kind of cancer that we have in our society of the conspiracy theories and so forth, I, I think I think one of the most important things we can do is explain the difference between opinion and fact, because that is a line that is getting blurred, and and um, the difference between something that is supported by evidence and by empirical data and and something that's just an opinion, and why there's a difference. So. I was in a meeting once and uh, and there was a, a bunch of people in there and one of them was one of these flat earth guys and he was trying to trying to tell me and I was explaining that no I you know I went up there and I, I went around we orbited around the earth I looked out the window it is indeed round and he said we're just gonna have to agree to disagree and I said no you don't get to disagree uh, you can't you can't disagree about a fact you can we can have different opinions we can disagree about whether or not broccoli tastes good okay? We can disagree about that. You can you can have an opinion that broccoli is delicious. I can have an opinion that tastes terrible. But and that that's fine. Okay, but you can't have an opinion about whether or not the the the, the nature, the truth of the universe, and how it works. And the the most important thing we can explain is that the the reason that there's this important difference between opinion and fact is not only is it important for truth, but the thing is that facts are useful. Okay. Uh, if you uh, come up to me and say that my opinion that the world is flat is just as valid as your opinion that it's round, I have to say, okay, well, show me the mathematical constructs, the equations, the models that allow you to take this flat earth uh, opinion and do something useful with it. The fact that the earth is round and we have a whole theory of gravitation, we have a whole calculus behind it enables us to predict the motions of the planets and enables us to put up satellites that provide GPS and allow us, allow us to navigate our airplanes and, and allow you to find your way to the falafel store or whatever. So, <laughs> so the, the, you know, there, there, there are useful things that come out of correct factual scientific theory. Uh, you can then use it to predict the future and to create uh, things and, and to send probes to other planets. We, if, if so I say, okay, if you think the Earth is flat, show me the mathematics that support that, that would allow me to send uh, uh, humans to the moon. Show me that. You can't, because all you have is an opinion. You don't have a fact, all right? So that's that's the difference. And I think we need to do a better job of explaining why that's important. Jared Reisman, thank you so much. You're 100% right. People mm -hmm. need to understand the difference between a theory scientifically and a theory in a colloquial sense. I wish we had more time to talk about this, but we're very limited on time tonight. Thank you again so much for joining us, and I hope you'll agree to come back for next year's conference. I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. It was, it was really nice talking to you. Thank you. Same here. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, 
We'll be back in just a moment uh, for me to introduce you to our next speaker. Since Ilan Ramon and the Columbia Space Shuttle tragedy, Israel hasn't had the opportunity to send any of its citizens to space. And this year, in coordination with the Ramon Foundation, uh, former Israeli Air Force pilot and entrepreneur Eitan Siba is going to become the second Israeli in space when he flies to the International Space Station as a private astronaut. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Eitan to speak about the scientific experiments and educational outreach and everything that he's planning to do while he's in space. Thank you very much, Kovi. And uh, the person you just interviewed, Garrett Reisman, the astronaut, he's the... He's to blame for me deciding to go to space because he was uh, managing the, uh, uh, the SpaceX uh, Dragon um, spacecraft program and I visited him there and then he, when they succeeded first time to, to connect and bring people to the uh, International Space Station, um, I just called to wish him uh, success and he said you're the next you're going next so it seemed like a dream um, and it still is part of a dream because the the mission will take place only a year from now uh, but I feel it's an inspirational mission and uh, the closest expression that I I would like to share with everyone here is uh, the Van Gogh story night if you don't mind to show it there you see the uh, unclear lines. It's a mix of imagination and reality. It's a, um, it's blending of the, the hills of the village, nature. It's blending of all these into the sky, being one part of it. On the left side, uh, just left of the tree, you can see the ISS uh, painted into there, but he was a really, a, a, this is really inspiring and in showing the, the connection that the sky and earth go together. It's not that you go to, to space in order to um, research only space travel and uh, the moon and Mars and all those programs, but it's all, lot, lots of the work performed on the ISS are to better life on Earth. So I'm I just started my plan. I'm going to space probably in a year from now. And I would like to share with you how I'm doing, how I'm preparing myself towards this mission. And uh, um, coming from an investment background, I'll bring to you the, the tools that I use for uh, impact investing which I'm doing for many years now, providing essential infrastructure and services to frontier markets, to underserved communities. And from that, I'm trying to build the mission in the best and have the, the largest impact of my personal mission uh, on society. So the first step is really to define clear objectives and measurable results. So the areas that we decided to focus on are three. Innovation, which is not only a, a technological, which is a very natural uh, focus of, uh, of space-related uh, activities, but also on academic research, on arts, humanities, storytelling, anything that can inspire people to dream to do better. The second sector is education, more to the younger generation to join STEM studies, to dream, to believe in their dreams and, and get more, more and more involved in, uh, in uh, whatever they have in mind and creation and not only to become an astronaut but to see that things can be achieved and uh, and, uh, and involve more and more children in the educational sector. And the third, if you can press again, it's obviously the cooperation. The ISS is celebrating 20 years, has celebrated last year 20 years of uh, continuous people being on the station. 
thousands of experiments. Um, so the cooperation, Kovi, if you can press another button, is starting with involving more and more government agencies, sharing and cooperating between private sector and government, public sector, which is this case. It, this is a natural development. The, the private sector getting more and more involved in the space exploration is very similar to other sectors like water and energy, where initially government would start, finance, and perform, execute, and later the private sector stepped in and started taking over and until a stage of investment, complete investment by private sector. And here we see this trend, and I see it as a very natural development. So the cooperation is between uh, government agencies, between I Israeli agencies and private sector and international, like we see here uh, all over the world, uh, uh, we will be an international team and we will have cooperation of all uh, space agencies from uh, different countries, the European, the Russian, Japanese, Israeli, obviously. And uh, um, hopefully have a really successful international cooperation. So we use in our impact investment, Kovi, if you can go to the next slide, we use a tool which we call the Vital Impact Diamond. So it's a, it's a tool where we define the four main angles, which are um, the beneficiaries, who are the beneficiaries of this mission, and there we want to plan on to reach more and more children and, and young people. Uh, in the innovation side, we want to reach the, the startups, the uh, um, all the ind industrial partners um, all over. And, and in the cooperation, we wish to really reach global cooperation, awareness to better life on Earth, and get uh, more and more people involved in the mission. Then, uh, for example, in essentiality, the question is, can such an effect be achieved through another tool? Are there alternatives? This is a question we ask ourselves in order to decide wh what to do and which experiments to carry out there. Um, our focus on innovation will be tech for good, so things that will We'll do experiments, we'll, do, uh, we'll take technological uh, uh, experiments to space, mainly to, to prove that uh, they are good for society, they are good for developing countries, for developing societies, and uh, the, the basically improve the quality of life of people on Earth. Um, one important aspect of the whole mission is, uh, to, is affordability of services. So I... I a sincere believer that the the start is very expensive it will space travel will be the cost will be reduced by competition by a, a more and more people wanting to go there and understanding the, the advantages of such a, a space travel and then um, locality is about from my point of view it's more involving more and more Israeli companies Israeli uh, companies are less involved in space uh, exploration. There are very few. I believe there will be more and more, not only in satellites, but in communication and life sciences and many more sectors. And the last angle of intrinsic is, uh, well, I intend to devote all my time there on the International Space Station, um, promoting these impact objectives. So the question in intrinsic is whether if I would spend more time on, in space, if it would have a larger effect, if I would go to the moon or to Mars, if that would even have a larger impact on society. I believe that the answer is yes, but we will study that and come with a, a, with a plan for me. Then the next phase would be the measurement. Okay, so we define the tool, we have the tool, we defined our objectives, what we're going to take. We have a scientific uh, committee, educational committee. These committees will 
select from all the choices of uh, proposals that will be presented, uh, they will select which of them uh, are best to take with us according to this criteria. Um, and then we'll measure. And the measurement will be basically in two aspects. The first will be outputs, how many experiments, how many people were got involved, young people that were uh, uh, took part in the mission, um, how many industries were involved, how many government agencies took part in the, in the mission. That's easy to measure. The, the tougher um, thing to measure, and this we are challenged by, is to see the long-term outcomes of this uh, investment in this mission. So will, how many agencies uh, will increase their involvement in, uh, in the space sector? Will the budgets for education grow in this, in this sector? Will there be more startups in the space ecosystem? How many children will prefer to learn STEM studies? And, and so forth. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, our first step, our first private mission to space will trigger more, will trigger competition, will trigger innovation. All this will make the, the sector more efficient and more uh, accessible to everyone. And last, not least, if you can uh, show the next slide, once we have all the mission defined and defined our measurement of output and outcomes, we will try and um, align the work we're doing with the United Nations Social Development Goals. There are 17 of those. Um, uh, for example, uh, water uh, purification uh, projects, uh, answer SDG 6, um, affordable energy, clean affordable energy, Energy is uh, answers uh, SDG seven, and uh, climate action obviously, which will, will be the next uh, global challenge after the COVID is uh, is uh, disappeared, uh, is gone. Um, no hunger, pro producing better nutrition, food, which is done uh, continuously in the in the space station, and so forth. So we will we will compare and uh, check the, uh, um, the results of our experiments with the United Nations SDGs. And as I uh, started the, our short talk, I, I really see the close link of the space, of the work done in space to the, our life on Earth. Thank you very much for listening. Eitan, thank you so much. Um, I think everybody can see from, from what you just showed how much of a huge impact and how much potential there is behind this educational mission um, and how much good science we're going to get out of it as well. Uh, and I really look forward to seeing all the content, all the videos that you put out from space. It'll be especially great to show my students so they can see an Israeli astronaut live in space. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank most you. Of the, most of the children that I meet um... They ask me, will you speak Hebrew when you're there? I told them, yes, I'm going to speak to you in Hebrew, live, <laughs> from space. <laughs> You'll have to teach the other astronauts Hebrew as well. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Eitan. I really appreciate Pleasure. it. Um, next, uh, before our next speaker, we're just going to show a short video um, about the Space Tech 2021 conference that's happening tomorrow, uh, which will highlight um, space industry and research here in Israel and around the world with uh, guest speakers including Gwen Shotwell of SpaceX and Charles Bolden, former NASA administrator. Um, so we'll now show you a short video about that conference tomorrow and then we'll go to our next speaker. Welcome to space. We are thrilled to invite you to Ramon Space Tech 2021 conference. The conference is powered by All Seated. Let's take a look. Our venue is located on the moon. Once you enter it, you can go directly to the main auditorium where you can hear talks from SpaceX presidents Gwen Shotwell, Ellen Stofan, Sarah El Amiri, Charlie Bolden, Michael Sufordini, and of course the second Israeli in space, Eitan Stiva. 
all around the floor, you can find booths of the top Israeli space companies and understand how they change the world. At the heart of the conference are professional workshops by the world's leading space experts in the fields of agri-tech, medicine, radiation, AI, air and water recycling, habitats and more. Each workshop will be in a room named after one of mankind's greatest space programs. Apollo, Gemini, Mercury, the shuttle program and Artemis. You'll be able to step inside and learn from these experts all you need to know about opportunities in the field. The main hall is designed as a space bar on the moon. Here you can network, chill and enjoy the vibe of this amazing conference. See you on January 25th. For tomorrow's event for the Space Tech Conference, we're actually going to be sending out a promo code at the end of this event to make sure that everybody who's watching tonight can uh, attend tomorrow's Space Tech Conference for free. So keep an eye out for that email at the end of this event. Um, it is my great honor to introduce our next speaker, Donald James. Donald served as NASA's Associate Administrator for Education under Charlie Bolden. Prior to that, he was the Education Director at NASA Ames Research Center. And after 35 years at NASA, he's now focused on consulting, public speaking, and nonprofit work. Donald, it's great to have you. Thank you so much, Kobe. It's, it's really, truly an honor to participate in the Ramon Science Communication Conference. I, I'm very honored. It's really great to have you here. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you can tell us about your experiences while you were at NASA, um, how you see the world of science communication, and how you saw it while you were there. Great, thanks. Let's pull up the slide, and um, I just want to say that it's truly an honor to participate and join many around the world to uh, honor the legacy of Ilan Ramon and Rona Ramon, who valiantly carried her husband's legacy of, of education and service. And um, I had the honor of, of meeting uh, Mrs. Ramon, not in person, sadly, on the phone, and uh, she asked me to participate in this conference. I promised her I would. Unfortunately, when I was on my way about a week out, I hurt my back severely, and but I promised her that I would uh, return and come back. So I just wanna say that this doesn't count. Uh, this is a great opportunity, but I need to be there in person. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, Actually, I think there's a, is there a slide right before that, please? There should be one on uh, accomplish. What are we trying to accomplish? It's right, it's right after the introductory slide. One more back, yeah. There we go, okay, great. The wonders of technology. Um, I like to start with this when talking about education and science communication is the question of what is it that we're actually trying to accomplish? And I'm going to speak a little bit about that from a NASA perspective, you know, from my own history there. But I would suggest that any organization or person or educator, uh, student who endeavors to communicate, especially about science or science matter, should really start with this question. And that is, what is it we're really trying to accomplish? Uh, now, this matters depending on, you know, whether your goal is just to enjoy listening to yourself talk or perhaps you might want to improve the science understanding of your audience. And there is a difference in how you would accomplish that in terms of the tools that you use. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. So, you know, when I look at NASA science communication, um, if you ask yourself, why is it that we do this? Well, it really is rooted in the enabling legislation which created NASA. We call it the Space Act of 1958. And if you look in the Space Act of 1958, it says that one of NASA's charges is to expand human knowledge and share the results widely. The wording is a little bit different, but that's basically what it says. In addition, over time, we've come to view that the purpose of communicating is number one, the people who paid for NASA, the taxpayers, because NASA is a federal agency, it's a public agency, they paid for it. So they have the right to know what it is that the agency is doing. The other thing uh, is it's an opportunity to generate support for the work that's done. If people aren't supportive of the work that NASA does, particularly the science missions, then it's not going to do us uh, a lot of good. Another goal is how can we advance science literacy? So 
uh, as you heard Garrett talk about uh, earlier, which I thought was so eloquent, and I really appreciate it, about the challenge of facts versus not facts, and, and how do you approach understanding your natural world? And so part of our mission is to be able to, uh, to help people understand why the knowledge that we're gaining is important, not only to them, but just to advance human knowledge in general, right? So that we can understand you know, our cosmos and our earth better. The other purpose of communicating is to increase the participation in the broad aerospace program. So it's very important to have many more people involved in that which what we're doing. And so that's the part that I really like, particularly with education, because it involves students. And lastly, I would say, and this is certainly not exclusive of other uh, reasons, but we're looking to diversify our workforce pool. It's very important, particularly in the United States, for students from all walks of life to know that they have an opportunity to participate in, in their aerospace program by direct engagement, that they see people that look like them, that they know that there's opportunities, that they know that uh, even though it might be difficult to get a particular job or anything like that, that they can actually participate. And so in, in NASA, we look at, if you look at the top going from left to right, we talk about informing people, inspiring people, engaging in employment. And I'm gonna go into that in just a little bit uh, more detail. Next slide, please. So let's just start with NASA's homepage. I mean, the thing that's amazing about, you know, surfing around uh, the NASA site is that all of the content that NASA produces and interesting images and things, you can find just about anything you want there. So this is a screenshot from a couple of days ago when they were doing the, the hot fire test for the new space launch system rockets down at Stennis Space Center. And you look at the information about the Mars rovers. Uh, and then in, you can see in the middle that we pay homage to uh, the Martin Luther King, because that's very important. So you can just find just about anything, right? So there's a lot of content that's out in the world. And I'm gonna come back to this point about uh, the content. Uh, one thing I will say, and I'll confess as a retiree of NASA, is that I now rely on our own NASA sites a lot more because when I was working, I used to see all this stuff you know, firsthand, but now I, I, I take advantage of the great information that's online in order to do my presentations or to talk to people. So nasa.gov is a great place to start for anybody. Next slide, please. So let's talk with informed. This is part of the, the grand communications uh, structure. And on the left side, you see that there's different modes of communication. On the right side, you see styles. Now, why do I point out these distinctions? I point them out because depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you might have to consider the different modes of communication that are available to you. It also depends on the time, right? When I uh, started with NASA 35 years ago, there were no podcasts. In fact, email was just barely getting started. Uh, there's no such thing as webinars and things like that. There were lots of magazines. We relied on television and print. And that's still available today, but depending on your audience and how you deliver information, there's different types of communications that are available to you. On the right side are different styles of communicating. Now, some of these distinctions overlap to a certain degree, but as a journalist, you're gonna do reporting. Uh, you might be doing a presentation like I'm doing now, or you might do a briefing, or you might use movies, or you might do a poster session if you're a student, or a demonstration in a classroom, or one of my favorite style of communication, which I think is very important, is storytelling. And you can see that storytelling is become increasingly important on how to communicate the, the wonders of space. So in form, we go to the next one. The next slide, please. We go to inspire. Now, Garrett mentioned this because he was talking about the role of science fiction and plays and inspiration. And I think, you know, this is something that has actually happened, right? So here's an example of uh, uh, the Black Panther, which is a very popular movement. And this is an article about, you know, the 
how the Black Panther can give a boost to diversity in STEM. And what they mean is someone sees a movie about, in this case, Black people who are very advanced scientifically. Of course, it's very fictional. There's a lot of things that you know probably defy the laws of physics, but people got really excited about it. So, you know, this is like the new Star Trek, you know? And so, um, I mean, I remember the early days of watching Star Trek thinking, wow, how cool it would be to actually talk to a computer, you know, which in my, and when I was in high school, it was a machine that not even was produced on a mass scale. And now, you know, I fight with Siri all the time, like my big sister, you know, whether or not we're successful in communicating, it just depends. So, so inspiration plays a, a much, a very important role in, 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 in getting students and other people interested in something. And I'm going to come back to this because with some very interesting uh, 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 facts that you just may not be aware of about how important inspiration is. Next slide, please. So then comes engagement. Now, engagement is about the doing. It's actually involved in the activity of something. So here are three examples of students that are engaged. They're actually working on, on in one case in the lower left, uh, an actual NASA activity. In the upper left, there's a student who's actually participating in communicating science himself. Maybe he's going to become a science communicator and he's honing his skills. In the right side, you see an example of the, the rover challenge, which happens at our Marshall Space Center. And I had the honor of going down there and watching the students who came from actually all over the world who had to build what they used to call the great moon buggy race, you know, based on the, the, the moon buggies that went to the moon. But how do you put together something that's, you know, built out of, you know, duct tape and other things and then go through these courses. So these are students who are learning how to work together. They're learning from the NASA people, the principles of the physics that are involved and things of that nature. So uh, this is a very, very um, important way of getting people excited about the work that's actually happening. And through osmosis, the, there's communication happening and there's learning that's happening as a result of this. The next slide, please. So then going through the continuum, we talk about employee. Now, ultimately, NASA wants to have a, a workforce that's capable of doing the work that NASA does, but it's not just for the agency, it's also for the entire nation. Now, this is an example of our recent NASA astronaut class. And now people you know, talk about they want to be an astronaut, and, and we all know that it's very difficult to, to be an astronaut. But the reason I wanted to bring this up, if you go to the next slide, please, I wanted to show this particular candidate, Laurel O'Hara, if you look at what I circled, she started as a NASA intern at our Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Then she went and worked and got involved in a NASA Academy at Goddard Space Flight Center. And then she flew on the KC-135 Reduced Gravity Student Flight Opportunities. So Laurel was very much steeped in this. And you can see at the end of the of the continuum, uh, we employed her as one of our astronauts. Now, I've actually had not had the privilege of meeting Ms. O'Hara before, but I'm sure she's just a wonderful person. And congratulations to her uh, for her accomplishment. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I just wanted to show very quickly the NASA STEM engagement portal. And if you see in the upper right, you see inform, engage, uh, educate, and employ. Um, and then on this particular portal, We've designed it to uh, uh, specifically for different grades and for teachers. Uh, in this particular case, on the front part of the page, we were very aware of the fact, and this happened after I left the agency, so compliments to my successor for doing this, uh, to make sure that uh, since a lot of students are having to work from home and do stu studies at home, we design content for the different grade levels to be able to do things at home. So I would encourage you to go, go there. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just another aspect of that. You can see that on this same STEM engagement portal we have for the students and for the educators. Uh, and then you can learn about STEM engagement, how to get internships. So it's all of there and, and it's designed to be able to be focused on the particular ages or the particular activity that they're doing. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about the challenges for effective science communication. Now, all of this is I see it, right? So this is 
from my experience and what I've learned is why I see it. First of all, communication, when we talk about communication, needs to be a feedback loop. I have a lot of interesting things happened to me when I was at work at NASA, where I have a colleague come up to me and said, Mr. James, Mr. James, you know, we have to do this. Did you, you know, did you, uh, did you get my email? And I looked at the person and I said, well, did I respond to your email? I mean, did I acknowledge that I got it? Or they'll say, well, I sent you that note, you know, well, communication is a feedback loop. You have to be able to acknowledge this. I mean, if you just watch any launch, you can see that the controllers on the ground and the astronauts, there always is a feedback loop. They never just, they, have, they acknowledge what is being said. So that's fundamental principle number one. Number two, Google, and by definition, a library of information in, is not communication, it's just information. So more has to be involved than just uh, having the information in front of you. I mean, just because Google exists now, doesn't mean I think that people are any smarter than they were before Google existed. I also argue that communication is not the same thing as understanding or learning, and that what's really key as a challenge is effective translation and interpretation. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that depending on your audience, you have to be able to be effective in how you're presenting the information. I can assure you as somebody who has made this mistake before, do not give a PowerPoint presentation to kindergartners. I made that mistake before, it doesn't work. Next slide, please. So what are some of the solutions? Well, as I see it, it's very important to strengthen engagement and participation. I think there needs to be a lot more of that, a lot more internships, a lot more mentorship and apprenticeship. You learn by doing, you learn by being actively involved in that which you're trying to learn. And if you're communicating science, actually have somebody do a science experiment or a demonstration, even if they mess up and don't get things right. That's really important. Another thing that I think is really important is storytelling. How do you tell an effective story, particularly depending on who your audience is? And again, I talk about effective translation interpretation. Do you really, really know your audiences? I've had the privilege of speaking to many audiences in my career, and it really depends on who you're talking to and what their histories are and background as to whether or not you want to be effective. Now, again, as I said, if your goal is just to uh, enjoy yourself talking, well, then go ahead and do that. But if your goal is to inspire somebody, to engage somebody, to transmit knowledge to somebody, it's important to have effective translation and interpretation for your audience. Next slide, please. So I'm switching gears a little bit, and then I'm going to close it with one last slide after this. And uh, this is my current work that I'm doing. On the right is a book that's coming out February 2nd, about manners. And underneath that book is a statement that is the answer that I typically give the students who always ask me, well, what do I have to do to, to get to work at NASA? And how, how do I become an astronaut? And how do I do this? And what grades do I have to get? And what schools I have to go to and all of that? And I typically come back to this and I say, being smart isn't good enough. And this book that I wrote about manners is called Manners Will Take You Where Brains and Money Won't is the longer answer to that, to that question. And the reason I showed the photograph in the left of my brother and me in the cockpit of his airplane, he's a captain with American Airlines. I like this photo because this was the day after I retired from NASA and my brother secretly arranged to fly me home from Washington, D.C. to California. And you see on the cover of the book, my mother holding my brother and me as little babies. So the question is, how did we go from those little kids to being the successful people that we are, I believe, if I may say so? Uh, well, the answer is inside the book. And the last slide, please, is at the end of the day, what I believe truly is that effective science communication is about effective connections. And this is what I write about in the book is how do you have effective connections? And I believe manners, as I define it, is a key skill to accomplishing that, is to be able to be effective at that. So 
I hope you find value in this. And I hope that those of you who are going to communicate science or communicate engineering or anything that perhaps is complicated, that you enjoy that process and engage people and tell great stories. So I thank you for this opportunity and uh, Kobe, back to you. Uh, I mean, it's me who should be thanking you, Donald. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing your insights with us. And uh, honestly, I really can't wait to read your book to, to, to hear your insights about how manners really, you know, make of the man uh, or woman. And yeah, just thank you again so much for being with us here tonight. My pleasure. My pleasure. So long. <laughs> thank you. All right. So we're now going to have a very short uh, video presentation uh, about, you know, science and from science and science communicators, followed by our first panel of the conference, which will be moderated by the one and only Ron Sparkman of Stardom. <laughs> Hi, I'm Abigail Bolenbach, writer and host for Infinity and Beyond, its actual rocket science educational video series with Astronomy Magazine. Hi, my name is Athena Brensberger, and I'm a science communicator that specializes in astrophysics. Hi guys, my name is Kat. I'm a deep space artist and science communicator. Hi, my name is Emily Calandrelli. I am a science TV show host, a children's book author, and in general, just a science communicator. Hi, my name is Esther Trevino. I'm from San Diego, California, and I'm a NASA Solar System Ambassador. Hello, I'm Giulia Bassani. I'm a student of aerospace engineering. I'm a writer of science fiction and also other genres and I'm a research associate at the Blue Marble Space Institute for Science. Hey everyone, my name is James O'Donoghue and I'm a planetary scientist at Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA for short. Hi, my name is Lee Giat. I am a filmmaker, science communicator, pilot, and amateur astronomer. Hello, this is Maisa Yazidi. I'm from Tunisia and I'm a PhD student at the Center for Studies and Activity for Space, Jesus at the University of Padua in Italy and also the founder of the Tunisian Association of Young Astronomers. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Parshidi Patel. I'm an astrophysicist and a science communicator. Hey all, my name is Kevin Jada Brun and I'm a former NASA rocket scientist. Hi there, my name is Bailey Burns and I'm an engineer and a science communicator. Science has been a part of my life for basically my entire life. It has been a critical and vital source that has shaped my personality. I wouldn't be who I am today without it. Where my real love for science stems way back to when I was 12 years old and I got a book of images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of things like galaxies and nebulae. And when I was 12 years old, I, I actually thought they were paintings. I didn't think they were real things that actually exist in our universe. And in instantly I just thought, wow, there's billions of stars out there and who knows how many planets where there might be life that exists, just like here on Earth. I first got interested in space when I was probably 12 and I found myself reading a book by Stephen Hawking, even though I still didn't know who Stephen Hawking was. So that was my first book on space. And since that moment, I continued opening books on space, basically. Ever since I was a child, I've been fascinated by science, especially space science. Uh, I used to watch a lot of science fiction movies and shows. Uh, I also used to look at encyclopedias and stop at any pages that were related to space. Uh, and I'd like exploring, and in my view, space science is one of the ultimate forms of exploration. I fell in love with science and space by watching the movie October Sky when I was just 10 years old. I saw that and I knew I wanted to design spaceships for NASA. I really got into STEM science engineering because I loved the how and the why. Now those math classes are the tests I had to study for the most in high school. So I really wanted to challenge myself when I went into college. That's why I chose engineering. Furthermore, I think I chose space because I like the next step. I like putting everything together and then saying, okay, well, what can we do with this? Can we go to the moon? Can we go to Mars? Can we go farther? And that's something that space has an abundance of is farther. How far can we go? When I went to the Fox Observatory when I was about 14 years old and I met a lady named Helen and she pointed to a dot in the sky and said, that's Jupiter. And I said, what? That, that star over there? That, like, it looked like a star. She taught me how to name every star in the sky. She taught me how to use telescopes. As an ambassador, we get to communicate the science and excitements of NASA's missions and discoveries to the community. 
The community that I specifically love to focus on the most is high school students. When I visited a planetarium, there is a particular uh, thing that drew me to it, and that was so many unanswered questions. There's so much out there that we don't know. There's so much out there that we can't see. In fact, my interest for space science and astronomy started in 2011, during my first year at the university when we had an introductory course about the Earth and the universe where we learned a basic notion about the universe, the solar system, the sun, the planets and their characteristics. There was a moment when I was about seven years old and we were meant to be looking at the Perseid meteor shower but um, yeah, it was too light polluted and probably too many clouds. I don't remember the, the meteor shower at all but I do remember using my dad's binoculars to see the moon and it was the first time I saw all these craters and honestly it was it was gorgeous And we are live. How's it going, everybody? Welcome once again uh, to our amazing conference today. And this is the first panel uh, of the evening, morning, whatever it may be for you, paving the way to STEAM using media to inspire the next generation. Moderated by me, I am Ron Sparkman. Uh, you may know me as the Space Dude. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief at Stardom and, of course, the chief curiosity correspondent for the Space Foundation. And today we have an incredible uh, group of folks to talk to about this particular topic. And uh, the first uh, person that we have on the panel today, Kelly Girardi, is an aerospace professional and science communicator. We also have Diana L. Cindy, known as the Arabian Stargazer, uh, Dr. Chris Ferry, uh, University of Technology in Sydney, associate professor and author, and uh, Shelly Brunswick, chief operating officer of the Space Foundation, and Dr. Ray uh, Abramovich, the Ramon Doctor of Philosophy uh, at DCASC. So you can tell everybody what that is if you want to, because I don't know what all that stands for. <laughs> so we're so glad to have you all on today. And uh, this is a wonderful topic. Um, <laughs> I understand completely. Uh, so uh, this is a wonderful topic. Kelly, I want to start with you first. Uh, what drives you to devote so much time towards suborbital flight and getting more people involved? Uh, you know, Obviously, Project Possum is a big piece of that that we're both involved in. So I'm sure that has a, a bit to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I love talking about science communication. Um, I think suborbital space flight to me has always represented our biggest opportunity to democratize access to space, right? When you think about the fact that, you know, we have less than a thousand humans who, who have ever been to space in the entire history of humanity, and you think about the capability of suborbital space flight to open up access to space for civilians, for researchers, for students, yes, for tourists, right? one company in their first or second or third year of commercial operations can single-handedly double the amount of humans who have ever been to space. So that's sort of the, you know, the value proposition that I like to look at when I think about how we can really open the fire hose on access to space and democratize it and ensure that, you know, this future for all of us, space is our collective past and future as a species. And we need to enable more access to it for a broader slice of humanity. So I think, you know, long answer short, that's something that's really driven me to invest in that specific area. And uh, you know, one of the ways that you've uh, kind of utilized this is through social media, like uh, so many people on our panel today, and uh, you've written a new book. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what your goal uh, with writing Not Necessarily Rocket Science was and how that's connecting people? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I'll, I'll share with everyone my deepest, darkest secret, which is that I have a film degree, right? I, I don't come from a traditional STEM background. I discovered, unfortunately, after college that my big passion was space and armed with a liberal arts degree, I was like, okay, how in the world do I contribute <laughs> to, you know, the, the final frontier, the world's most exciting industry? And I had to carve my own path. I, I felt like I, I really needed to prove that I could belong and access um, this industry and then create value inside of it. And so I wrote not necessarily rocket science as a way to share that path for other people and to show that, you know, I, I think that the space age, like much like the Renaissance, uh, was a broader cultural movement. It wasn't just art, right? You saw cultural innovation happening across science, philosophy, even warfare, medicine, science, right? So too does the space age have a broader cultural impact. It's not just engineering and our next giant leap will require the talents of artists, engineers, and everyone in between. So I wrote the book to share a little bit of my journey in this industry and to show other people that, you know, there is a place for all different skill sets. I agree with you completely, DJ. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that there was a place uh, for me and it, it, there really is. It's it doesn't matter what you do or where you've come from. Uh, we need everybody for the space industry. And that's what it, what makes it so important. 
so um, the next thing I want to go to is Diana. Uh, you've been doing some incredible work for the last few years, reaching out to not just English speaking, but Arabic speaking groups uh, through the Arabian Stargazers. So I want to talk a little bit about that and uh, just how quickly that exploded. You know, it was pretty much, you know, a little less than a year, 100,000 followers on just Instagram alone. So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of that to you, how that got started and uh, how you're utilizing that to uh, to connect people. Yeah, um, it's very nice to be here and seeing familiar faces. Thank you for having me. Um, the Arabian Stargazer, if the people who are watching are not familiar, it's a bilingual science communication uh, platform where we talk about science and specifically space and the importance, importance of it, as well as sharing some tips and tricks that I use that I wished I knew when I was in college throughout my career. Um, I think the reason why it reached a lot of attention at the beginning, because it's kind of um, uh, a neglected career and industry in that region. Um, a lot of people who are interested in space and science didn't really have someone speaking about that in, in a fun, short fashion. It's, it was, you have to read a scientific journal in order to learn a few things. And there wasn't really a lot of access and opportunities in, in that area. So I noticed that there's a gap in science communication in Arabic. Um, I researched YouTube and uh, a lot of platforms about people who are speaking about science and space and sharing their experience. And unfortunately that didn't exist. So when I created the Arabian Stargazer, it was kind of uh, coming from the idea that you should be excited about science. It's not intimidating. A lot of people in the Middle East and everywhere, honestly, in the world has the idea that you have to be very smart, uh, a genius in math. Um, you have to go to space to be part of space, which is not the case. I'm an engineer. I've worked in, in propulsion for the past seven years, and I don't necessarily wear a space suit when I go to work. And that's often kind of the the impression uh, behind my job. So just trying to fill in that gap. And I've seen amazing engagement. Many people are really interested in this. And I get messages of people who are who say because of the Arabian Stargazer, now I'm messaging you from my dorm in Stanford, and I'm originally from Egypt, I never thought I would be here uh, without knowing that I actually can do this. There are scholarships, and there are things that I could do to be a better scientist or engineer. Um, so that's just kind of in a nutshell. And you have done incredible work over the last few years. And I know that you have uh, a big dream one day. So can you tell us if there was one STEAM project that you could magically fund for students in the Middle East, what would it be and why? Have you, you ever thought, maybe, may, maybe you know. you've thought about this before. <laughs> <laughs> you know the answer to that. So, I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> my uh, ultimate passion is to build multiple science camps across the Middle East and hopefully expand to the world. Um, that would be just teaching them how to do simply programming and how to make a presentation, uh, building a satellite. One of my uh, most memorable memories is being in college, uh, leading a team of, uh, of students who are working on a 6U CubeSat that is going to space. And I was part of a NASA competition. I would never be excited about space without that, that opportunity. Um, SEDS, it's called SEDS, uh, Students for Exploration and Development of Space. And from then I realized that just school and my degree is not going to make me um, a unique engineer or is going to teach me tangible skill sets. Um, so I want to kind of create the same experience in the Middle East, create competitions, and we would teach them everything they need to know about being an engineer in a non-traditional way, not a textbook uh, kind of path. And I mean, so everybody on here is communicating to people in different ways, but Chris, yours is a different audience. So uh, you want to tell us a little bit about why you decided the group that you wanted to speak to and the, uh, and the awesome work that you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think it was because I had kids of my own. Um, I wouldn't even have been aware uh, of the existence of children's books um, ha had I not had children of my own. And, you know, when you look at the children's literature, uh, at least maybe six years ago, um, you would find that there wasn't a lot of uh, science books, no, certainly not for for babies. And I mean, if if you don't, if you've never interacted with babies and you don't have babies, you'll you won't know that uh, baby books come in these kind of hard cardboard, uh, thick uh, style books. And there was no science books. There's all ABCs and animals and these sorts of things. And I thought, wow, there should really be some science books for for this age group. 
and and I decided, uh, hey, I'll I'll give it a go. I'll try it uh, on my own, and I I did, and it seems to have seems to have stuck. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little popular. So, what's the most complicated thing you've ever tried to explain to a baby? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, uh, the surprisingly the most popular book is Quantum Physics for Babies. Um, the publisher told me they waited so long to contact me about it because I had originally self-published it uh, because it, it, it should never work. That was their research. Um, so yeah, uh, so it's quantum physics, uh, you know, a full disclosure, it's, it's for the parents. It's not for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> There's no test for the uh, infants at the end. <laughs> So uh, obviously the, these things are really kind of blown up. You, maybe it wasn't something that you were expecting. As you mentioned, uh, they were kind of telling you, well, we're not exactly sure if this is going to work. So um, how have you been able to reach out and use this in different ways, say like utilize YouTube uh, videos in general in a way to inspire the next generation with these, these really, if you can, if you can, I think it was Einstein that said, if you can break it, if you can't break it down and explain it to somebody on a level that they understand it, then you don't understand it. And trying to attempt to do that with quantum physics with, astrophysics is just one of those things that if you can do that with, you know, you know, the parents more so than the children, uh, then you know that you've done your job right. So what are the ways are you kind of utilizing this, uh, the skill set that you have to connect with folks? Yeah, it's really difficult, um, to be honest. So if you think about in the typical audiences on Instagram, you know, you certainly have as as the great scientific communicators in this panel have shown, um, you know, audiences for science, um, but they typically don't coincide with audiences that are buying children's books and, and you know, baby, you know, merchandise, right? So, so my following on social media is quite small because my tip, my audience, is the audience that would typically follow people that are selling more traditional uh, stuff for kids. So I think it, I, I find it very difficult um, to connect. To, to find these, even find the people that have my books online, um, I'm assuming maybe many of them, you know, aren't on social media. I, I think we're at over 5 million copies of books worldwide. Um, and I see lots of pictures online of, of, um, of kids with, with my books, um, but the, they don't seem to be the kind of people that want to engage in the same way as, as with science communication. I think with science communicators, you know, people follow them on social media because they want to to learn cool facts and and hear from their from their favorite um, from their favorite educator. Whereas uh, you know, people that buy baby books, I think you know they, uh, I can attest, they have a different set of priorities. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, your your work has been wonderful, and again, we have so many authors that are on uh, here today. And uh, so, Shelley, I want to go to you next. There's a lot of amazing ways that we connect with folks uh, in the science communication uh, arena at the Space Foundation. So, as our COO, uh, how are you working to get people into the space industry? Because for you, it's not just one particular group. You're interested in how can we get everybody involved, and uh, you know, it's one of the one of the best parts about the job that we do. Well, thank you, Ron. It's an honor to be joining you as well as the other esteemed colleagues today to talk about this important subject of how do we break down barriers to allow more access and opportunity into the space economy? And that includes, as you said, STEM jobs, but also non-STEM jobs, artists, business administrators, entrepreneurs, as well as STEM professionals. And so it's important at the Space Foundation that we go through our five-step workforce development roadmap. And that involves awareness, access, training, connecting, and mentoring. And each one of those uh, steps allows us to break down barriers to allow more access into the space economy. And so it's exciting to be part of that. And this falls under our Center for Innovation and Education at the Space Foundation. And that's all about creating workforce development and economic opportunity. So all individuals uh, can participate in the space economy, especially as we look at the space ecosystem growing, from over $400 billion to one to $3 trillion. We need to find a way for those who have not been part of the space ecosystem to find a pathway in. 
And uh, so there's another organization that you've been working with closely this year. Well, one of a few, I guess I should say, uh, and that's Space for Women. Um, and it's it's been an incredible group. I've met a lot of wonderful uh, people through that program. Uh, you introduced us to it. We were sharing it out on social media. So lots of new friends this year. Uh, but how is Space for Women playing a role in building the next generation in STEM and uh, STEAM? Well, again, thank you for asking that question. Uh, the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs created the Space for Women program. And under that is the Space for Women uh, Mentor Network program. And I am one of 35 mentors around the world that participate in that. And there are other men and women that participate in the program. And our goal, again, is to create that access and opportunity so that girls and women around the world can find their way into STEM careers but also the overall space economy. And again, that relates to STEM careers, but also entrepreneurship opportunities. Great, great opportunity um, in developing countries that are emerging into the space economy for women to be part of the, of the ecosystem using space-based technology to start a business, to help their family, to help their community. So when we look at the space-inspired um, economy, we have to remember those entrepreneurs that may be taking and utilizing space technology to create a business. When you think about GPS, most people don't think about the $1.3 trillion economy GPS has unlocked since 1983. So as you think about the space economy, think about those other areas, the internet of things, 5G, miniaturization, advanced manufacturing, data analytics, cybersecurity. Those are all great jobs right here on earth that can be unlocked by entrepreneurs. And if you're looking for a great idea to unlock through entrepreneurship, NASA has a wonderful website for tech transfer, patents they have from the space program. ESA, the European Space Agency, also has one. So again, we want you to look at those STEM careers. We want you to be artists. We want you to be entrepreneurs. So there's never been a better time than to be part of the space economy than right now. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Dr. Reed, I want to go to you next on this. Um, with all the amazing work that you do, one of the big ones is DMARS. That's how we connected some years ago when we did uh, our interview for uh, the Mars Society and uh, Red Planet Radio. So quick plug there for, for, for over there. I just want to make sure they get a smile in too. Uh, but um, you've really been doing amazing work with that. So uh, I want to first have you share what that is for folks that may not know. If they don't know, uh, they may know some of the U.S.-based uh, simulations um, but what you all are doing over there is amazing work and how that really matters in communicating the science, uh, because analog missions are truly something special. And the same, a, a bit of the same, too, with what uh, Kelly and I do with citizen scientists, astronautics program like Project Possum. You get out a whole lot more to regular folks when they realize that regular folks can do these types of things. So definitely want to talk to you a little bit about your work there. OK, so thank you very much. Um, so I have co-founded together with a group of people DMARS, which is Desert Mars Analog Remote Station. I've been the scientific director and I also have been an analog astronaut out there in the desert, in the Israeli desert, in the Ramon crater, which looks and feels like Mars. And we've realized that we have a very unique natural resource at our uh, disposal that we can use in order to bring as many people as possible into science and specifically into the space sciences, into the beautiful age of the golden age of exploration of space that we are now at. And I'm very happy uh, that that initiative took off. And we have several analog missions. As a science director, I had to build up my team in order to make sure all the different test uh, all the different experiments, how would they work, how to explain them um, to the PR people and to students who come and look at our work. Uh, we had international and national collaborations. We had uh, almost three experiments per day for an average, on average, on, a, on an analog mission. And uh, just recently, I was able to actually publish a peer-reviewed article on the scientific uh, experiments I did, I did myself with the team there about cross-contamination issues in a planetary mission. So the beauty of this is that we're using this platform as a, to, to make people understand and come and even we, um, we choose certain individuals which are happy to put their time into it and training into it. And we are very happy to let them understand in their bones what it means to be in an, in an isolated planetary habitat. And you have to do um, all these experiments. You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of your crew. It's usually six to eight people inside a habitat. You have a delayed communication. So we're doing this analog simulation thing. But we're really, at this stage, it's just the beginning. We're really open to a lot of 
people and ideas. And what we find out is that we find that people are really hungry for this kind of a thing. Even though now, because of COVID, there's a bit of a delay in all our um, operations, even though we do them in isolation, it's a different type of isolation than what the regulations are now, are now requiring us. But for instance, we're going to have an international collaboration with the uh, Austrian Space Forum. They are coming uh, this October, November to Ramon Crater to do a full on mission from the space um, from the Austrian Space Forum. And they have a much more uh, massive uh, experienced uh, platform. They're going to use something which is called Exploration Cascades. And what I found out is that in being a science communicator, you know very well that there is a huge gap that you need to jump over in order to get people understand what it means to do science and what is a good science. It's really not that easy. And when you have such a beautiful platform, just like the suborbital flights, I imagine, and other things as well, you need people to engage physically, mentally, and emotionally in doing a little bit of science outside in their own world. And then they can understand what it means to do science. In addition, because I'm there and other people there, we do a lot of um, we promote a lot of women activity within these in, the, in that platform because we want to see more women in sort of like role models and doing science and doing engineer. Israel, even though it's, it's quite innovative in some aspects, in other aspects, it's very religious, it's very conservative. Most women talk about how it's uh, happy to be at their house, at their home, having children, raising a family. <laughs> it's very hard for us to get people out of their comfort zone and talking about different things like, okay, but if you could work and live in space, what would you like to do? And this kind of a platform let people play a serious role. It's a serious analog mission and they understand they can do other things as well. And then they spread it inside their communities. And it's just a very, it's a blessing to be part of such a project. So and, that's uh, the DMRC, yes. See, I do uh, other stuff other, other than that. <laughs> well, uh, then let's talk a little bit about that, what you do at the uh, Davidson uh, Institute for Science Education. Um, right. what, what, how are you reaching out to folks there? How are you communicating the science? How, how did you get involved with the Institute? Uh, tell us all about it. So I got involved with the Institute through Professor Oded Haronson from the Planetary Sciences. Um, he wanted, he introduced me to the Davidson Institute because they didn't really have a really good handle on space sciences and they needed someone who had a PhD in that area who was a good communicator who can um, help their staff in order to spread out the word. So basically him and then uh, another person who wanted me to do, uh, help him write and create an astrobiology centered module inside a big problem, inside a big program, which we call the Young Astronaut Academy. Now the Young Astronaut Academy, it's funded by the Israeli Space Agency. It's for junior high, sort of like 15 year old. And we train them a year and a half as astronauts without the suborbital flights, unfortunately, but we are able uh, to get them out to the field and do a lot of interesting stuff in the field as well as space sciences. And eventually they do an analog mission. So it's, I think it's the only place in the world where junior high, high school students uh, do analog mission. You train them for it. They do it without the supervision. There is an adult, but it's like 50 meters, 100 meters away from the habitat. And they, they need to come up with the experiments, with their schedules, what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're going to do if there's like some sort of an emergency, what are the communication lines and so on and so forth. It's a lot of responsibilities. But on the way, they do the science as well. And like I said, it's a great way to teach them about the science that they're being taught, whether in classes or through our program. So in the Davidson Institute, I help them with different uh, space issues that they need some help or advice or someone to communicate with. And also with this uh, Young Acad Academy program, which now I am the manager of it, but in the south of Israel. So I moved the program to the uh, Arava and Desi Science Center, which is a regional area. I'm much more interested in bringing space exploration to the periphery both the social periphery and both the regional periphery. It's area, uh, usually areas which don't get a lot of funding. Um, they're very widespread. A lot of towns are isolated a little bit from one another. I know it sounds crazy because Israel is so small, but trust me, there is an isolation issue down south. And you also get a lot of different population. You get Bedouins, you get Arabic, um, you get um, people from Ethiopia who came to Israel 20 years ago. And then you get also a lot of people from kibbutzes and Moshav and so on and so forth. So it's really interesting for me to try and do space exploration and put it to the next generation, basically, but do it in the south of Israel, where it's closer also to the Negev, to the Ramon crater. It makes the whole area so much more valuable 
for the people who are actually there. So that's part of also like bringing in the pride in your place and understanding what an amazing place it is because it's like Mars. You can do space tech analogy. You can do, you can try different experiments, different technologies, whether it's in agri-tech or via monitoring, and you can show them that they're worth something. So it's a very interesting area to do the Young Astronaut Academy down in the South. And um, we have a one more year to go. And this has been a very challenging year for us. And we had to shift part of our teachings completely online, which was trickier than I thought. But we're happy to say that they will have an analog mission. And I think it will be a very interesting, like once, one in a lifetime experience for junior high, for high school students, really once once in a lifetime. So I'm very happy to do that. And aside from that, I'm doing a little bit of research as well, from astrobiology, extremophiles, and also very interested in cross-contamination issues and to understand if we have a planetary crew and they go into a new area, um, let's say the moon, and we're not expecting anything to grow or happen on the moon, but what happened with all the microbiota and stuff that the crew comes with? We are not sterilizing our uh, spacecrafts anymore. So some bacillus, some other stuff do survive, they go there, what happens to them? Do they go? Do they undergo mutation? Do they spread somehow to the environment? Do they survive there? How long does it take for the spreading to occur? What happens when you have back cross contamination back to the crew? Does it affect their health? Yes, no, we don't know yet. It's just, you know, preliminary studies. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're doing at the moment. That's what I'm doing. Uh, it's, it's incredible work really from all of you. So what I want to do as we wrap up here is uh, give each of you 60 seconds, a little bit of your own advice on uh, what you would want to let people know about being a science communicator, how you can be involved in what you can do, and then also where we can find you on uh, social media. So Diana, I'll go with you next. And then uh, Shelly, I'll go to you after that. You are muted, Diana. Sorry, guys. What had happened um, was. <laughs> I said, um, it was really great to have you here. Um, I got introduced to new people, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, my advice, um, to, if you want to be a science communicator, is try to find a niche, something that is special to your own brand, because at the end, we are brands and we are trying to do something um, that represent us and our personalities. Um, and, and just don't be afraid to start. Usually the start is the most difficult thing to do. Uh, trying to stay consistent is also very difficult, but when you do something that you're very passionate about, um, that passion is going to show, and that's what people are going to be attracted to. Um, you can find me on the Arabian Stargazer on Instagram. Um, you can also email me uh, any questions you have on the Arabian Stargazer at gmail.com. Fantastic. Thank you, Diana. Shelly, we'll go to you next. Same question. Well, thank you again, Ron. It's been an honor joining this esteemed panel today. And what I would recommend is if this is something you're passionate about, Find a mentor. There are many mentoring programs out there. We mentioned one, the UN Space for Women. There's Women Tech Net Network. There's SGAC. Uh, there's so many others. So find a mentor and also be a mentor because you can be a mentor at any point in your career to help inspire the next generation. The other thing is build your network. If this is not an area you're familiar with or you're learning about being a science communicator or the space industry, Start to reach out to those organizations I just mentioned, not only to find a mentor, but to start to com connect with other individuals that think like you, that are excited about the things you do, and start building uh, connections and collaborations so that you too can rise up and help the next generation. You can follow me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and also you can follow the Space Foundation and go to our website at spacefoundation.org. Again, thank you, Ron, and thank you to our wonderful panel. Thank you so much, Shelly. And uh, next, Chris, want to go to you. I mean, yours is a little bit different how you've done it. So tell us you know, the, the best way you think that people can reach out in what was a, a calculated risk and ended up being a good one. So uh, what's your advice there? Sure, yeah. So um, you can find me, and my handle is is below there. It should be um, on Twitter. And uh, and you can reach out via, via Twitter or that's my email, um, my web address as well, csferry.com. Uh, I guess my advice would be to, practical advice would be to write everything down. So, you know, I had the idea for quantum physics for babies long before I ever you know, tried it out. And probably if I hadn't written it down and at least like sketched out what I, what I was thinking at the time, it never would have happened. And if you're anything like me, then you'll, you'll forget and the worst thing is that you'll remember that there was something you were supposed to remember and you'll think, ah, what was that thing? I, I couldn't, 
I know there's something, but I can't remember it. So write, write everything down, uh, put it in a folder, whatever, and go back to it uh, on a regular basis. And you'll pick out an idea and, and something will have coalesced or you'll meet someone that uh, in your network. And, and that's when the genesis of the idea will really start. Wonderfully said. Uh, Rio, we'll go to you next. Hi, thank you very much. Um, all I have to add is be the shaman of your community. Be the scientific shaman of your community, especially during pandemic time or other anxiety time. It's good that you know the science. Just start with your own community from the ground up. Don't flourish all over the place. Find what you're passionate about. Do the scientific work behind it and work with your own community. That would be the best blessing that you can bring. Thank you. You can find me on Facebook and on LinkedIn and on Twitter as well. Thank you. Awesome. And Kelly, you literally just wrote the book on it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it's funny. Like when I think about this question, I think about how I used to feel so self-conscious when someone would call me an influencer or, you know, allude to a large social media footprint. But in reality, it's the advice that I would give anyone starting out, especially in an industry like this, because what is that? It's, it's to have a platform is to have a voice and to have a voice is to have influence. And after a decade of whiteboards and war rooms, you know, I've learned that the people who are designing the technology hold the power to influence how it's applied. And in a high tech, high stakes industry like ours, like aerospace, it's in everyone's best interest that you cultivate this broadest perspectives and broadest possible set of voices um, to attack those complex problems of the future. And, you know, just, just to close out my thoughts on it, what really drives me to keep sharing, keep inserting myself in the conversation is when we talk about space exploration, we're really talking about the future of the entire human species, right? So, you know, the stakes are too high for any single demographic to be steering the entirety of Spaceship Earth or steering the conversation or direction. So I especially encourage a, a wide variety of folks to find their voice in the conversation and, and start putting their thoughts out there. I told uh, Kelly, I think it was around the Humans to Mars Summit, that I was uh, going to pay her to speak to teach me to speak that articulately all the time. Uh, so, uh, listen, this panel has been wonderful. Thank you all so much for coming on and joining us today. Uh, your your insights are invaluable. And uh, so we are going to move on to the next panel. But uh, thank you to everybody. So, thank you uh, so much. It's been wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It's been so thanks, wonderful everyone. to have you. All right. We'll love. see everybody on the next one. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Love, Stay love. safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ron. And of course, a huge, huge thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Kelly, Diana, Chris, Shelley, and Raut. That was absolutely amazing. The next portion of our conference is designed to highlight the incredible work done by some fantastic science communicators. Now, first spotlight talk is going to be given by Kirsten Banks. Kirsten is a science communicator and astrophysicist at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. She's passionate about space, Aboriginal astronomy, and sharing her love for the cosmos with the world. Kirsten, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for introducing me, Kobe. Uh, it's so humbling to be invited onto this uh, conference to talk about all about SciComm. It's it's fantastic because SciComm is my life, basically. So let me introduce myself for those who may not uh, know me or may not have heard of me before. My name is Astro. Uh, my name is Astro Kirsten. Just by the way, it is um, six thirty in the morning where I am in Australia. The sun is just starting to rise, so. We'll see how the brain works. The cognitive ability of my brain is not going so well this morning, but we'll go. We'll get there. Uh, but my name is Kirsten Banks, or Astro Kirsten, as you may know me on all the social medias. Uh, I'm an astrophysicist and science communicator, and I've always had a passion for the skies. When I was in primary school, I actually wanted to be a meteorologist. So imagine just smaller Kirsten at three years old saying in kindergarten, I want to be a meteorologist. And apparently I knew what that word meant because I wanted to learn more about the weather and the sky. And I was fascinated by storms and tornadoes. I would watch Stormwatch on National Geographic. But then in high school, the the defining moment for me was in about year nine or year 10. So I was about 15 years old. My science teachers took my entire year group on an excursion to go see this documentary about the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm sure we have all seen a beautiful photo of Hubble or a photo taken by Hubble at least once in our lifetimes because it is just gorgeous. So I was sitting there 
watching this huge screen with these one size fits none, honestly, uh, glasses slipping off my face for this 3D movie. And I was just inspired by the mystery of our universe and I needed to learn more about space. And that's what kind of led me towards being an astrophysicist. But funnily enough, I hated public speaking. I was terrified of public speaking when I was in primary school and high school. I would shake, I would sweat, I would just not be comfortable at all. But my science communication journey started when I decided to get a job at Sydney Observatory, which is this museum at in Sydney that it's not a working observatory. It stopped working as a functioning observatory in the 1980s and was a museum ever since. So I got a job there in my first year of university and Turns out I have a knack for science communication and I really, really enjoyed talking about space and astronomy with anyone and everyone who was willing to listen. So I, that's where my science communication journey started. And from there, I started to get a lot more opportunities. So while working at Sydney Observatory, I actually got on an episode of Play School. It's awesome. I, I, for those who may not know Play School, it's this children's show in Australia that every single child watches when they're growing up every single one so i got an episode on play school i went through i think the the diamond door or the diamond window wanted to go through the round window not gonna lie it looks like a telescope but you get the window you get when you go on play school but from there i was just getting more and more opportunities and my outlook in life is to just follow these opportunities and see where it leads and so far it's led me to yeah, which I'm really happy to be here and uh, to talk to you guys about my SciComm journey. So from these opportunities, I've also gone to do uh, mostly school talks. So I love talking at schools, especially primary schools and high schools, because talking to children is so important because that's when that was the moment when I found my calling and my passion for the universe. You know, they we're so curious when we're younger that we need to be open to what we want to learn about. So I love talking at schools. I also do lots of public talks as well, conferences like what we're doing right now, uh, and a little bit of radio and TV. It's lots and lots of fun. But all of that changed in 2020. Everything got flown out the window and suddenly we weren't allowed to go anywhere. I couldn't go to schools, the schools shut down. I couldn't go to public talks. They were all canceled or moved online, which just, it was difficult, right? We've all been there. We've all had to move online. We've all had to change the way that we live so drastically because of this global pandemic that we are encountering and still battling through today. So I had this itch. I still had this SciComm itch and I had to do something but I couldn't do what I used to do because of those limitations. I couldn't go to schools. I couldn't go to public talks. I couldn't do that. But then I found this app called TikTok and I decided mostly out of boredom that I wanted to go and try TikTok. So I joined TikTok actually about a year ago, a few, few a year and a few days ago. And I noticed when I was watching through TikTok and just scrolling, checking out what's going on, that there wasn't a lot of, science content or space content on TikTok. It was just, you know, people lip syncing to common uh, songs and popular songs or doing dances for, I can't believe I just did that on, on a live conference, but here we are. But, you know, people were dancing to popular songs and, and that was mostly what TikTok was. There wasn't a lot about, uh, you know, science. So I decided to change that. I wanted to change this and bring more science to TikTok. But it was going to be a challenge. Because on TikTok, for those who may not be on the platform, which I, if you if you uh, if you're not on TikTok, stay that way. <laughs> it is it is a black hole of your productivity, depending on how you use it. But TikTok, when you post a video on TikTok, you are limited to sixty seconds. Now, I'm an astrophysicist. Astrophysics is hard. There are lots of very complex topics within astrophysics and talking about the universe. How on earth was I going to squish this huge amount of knowledge and this huge amount of information into just 60 seconds? So it posed this challenge to me to try and change the way that I do SciComm. So I realized that I had to be much more fluid with my science communication. And I tell you what, I thought I understood 
how to do science communication. I thought I understood how to engage an audience for 90 minutes on a tour at the observatory. I thought I knew how to engage children in a 60 minute uh, period of lesson, a uh, period of time for a lesson. Boy, was I under a false sense of security because that all changed in 2020 with TikTok. Because the thing is, people's, uh, people's attention spans are so short. So even if I were to make a video for 60 seconds explaining the cosmic microwave background radiation, it may not perform well because it goes for way too long. This short, sharp content is what does well on TikTok. Uh, and so what I did is I just kind of tried different things. When I joined TikTok, there was no blueprint. There was no science content, right? So there was no blueprint. There was nothing to follow and nothing to like, copy or gain inspiration from. So what I did, I just tried a few different things, tried a few different topics, tried a few different ways of introducing those topics, tried a few different ways of even just telling information and, and giving information without even talking. So one of my favorite videos that I'm so proud of over the last year is this video I made. It was 15 seconds long, 15 seconds. Didn't speak at all. All I did was held up my iPad with different planets on it and spun around to show the different speeds at which the planets in our solar system rotate. So you start with Mercury going very slow, Venus going slow but backwards, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. But then I think this was the part that really, uh, what I attribute my success in 2022 is for Uranus, the tilt of Uranus is about 90 degrees. So what I did is I took my iPad, I got down on the floor and I rolled around on the floor pretending to be Uranus. So whenever I'm asked, what would I attribute my success to? Oh, I cannot speak. Success. That's the word. What can I attribute my success to? And that is rolling on the floor, pretending to be Uranus. It's, it's, quite, it's quite the conversation starter. But here's what I've learned so far with making these videos. What I've learned so far is that people have really short attention spans. So the shorter the video, the better it performs. And the more that people see it and the more that people get inspired by space, whether they're young kids on the platform and they're getting inspired by space for the first time, or if they're part of the older generation who have lost touch with their curiosity with space, then they are re reignited and excited once again to learn about space and astronomy, which is just, I love both ends of that spectrum. Uh, things to do as well is to try and have fun with your science communication. If you're having fun and that comes through off the screen, people are going to enjoy it. But here's the thing to remember as well. Keep in mind that you're not going to please everybody. So TikTok is quite a global platform. The, if I have a look at my analytics, most of my followers are from the US, which the US use imperial measurements instead of metric. So with every single video that I make, to make it accessible to everyone is not only do I include distances in kilometers, I also include distances in miles. You know, it's speed in kilometers per second, miles in, uh, speed in miles per second. Okay, making it accessible for everyone so that everyone can understand it and everyone has it in a language that they can understand. Um, but the thing is, the final things I wanna bring to you guys is that we need to be more fluid with our SciComm. We need to be more fluid with how we promote and communicate science to the public because the way that we consume content, and if 2020 is any example of this, the way that we consume content is changing so much. So if we keep doing the same thing, we're gonna get left behind. And society needs us. We need science, communicator, commu science communicators to keep inspiring the next generation and to keep inspiring the current generation too. So. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you want to see more space content on your TikTok, follow me at Astro Kirsten and I will see you there. You know, I was getting so close to finally opening a TikTok account. And like I saw your videos and I saw Eloise's videos and, and I kept kind of holding back and, and you saying now that it's a black hole for productivity, you might have convinced me. I'm opening a TikTok account tomorrow. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Join the space fam on TikTok. It's it's lots of fun. <laughs>
<laughs> I definitely will. And uh, I have to say that your comment about going through the diamond window absolutely took me back to my play school days. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten, for speaking to us and for, for waking up so early um, to, to share your story and to share your insights. Um, this, is, this has been really great. So thank you. My pleasure. Um, our next speaker for the evening um, is the incredibly talented uh, Catherine Matchin. Kat is a deep space artist and science communicator extraordinaire who is devoted to sharing her love for the stars. And honestly, her artwork leaves me speechless. So I, I, I think I'm going to just have to leave the talking to you, Kat. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Kobe. It's great to be here, guys. And uh, thank you for taking the time to watch this. Um, as I'll just give you a very quick rundown of myself. I've decided that I'm not really going to do much on me. I'm going to focus on teaching you guys how to be an absolute badass and how to dominate social media. So I'm the world's highest uh, crowdfunded painter. I work with space authorities to uh, communicate science, and I've been working with companies like the Discovery Channel and any, everyone, including ro leading rocket companies. Um, anyway, so I want to tell you a story, and it's where we start, which is the importance of SciComm. Behind me is a photo I took of an amazing uh, monolithic sacred rock in Australia called Uluru. And... Um, the reason why SciComm is so important is because, uh, you know, people are becoming more and more disconnected from the stars. Um, I was there two years ago and we had this event where we all sat around in tables, uh, having like dining under the stars. And at some point they turn all the lights out and you could see the full stars. Now Uluru is an incredibly remote area, very, very dark. And you could see so many stars. And I know like if you've ever been out either camping or you're lucky enough um, to live somewhere where it's very, very dark. It's incredible how many stars. In a city, you don't really get to see that. Um, and a guy came up to me as I was taking photos of the night sky, and he said, excuse me, ma'am, what is that? He was pointing to the Milky Way. He was about 70 years old, and he'd never seen the Milky Way. And the thing that shocked me is I stood back and I had this realization that here is someone like 70 years ago, the light pollution was nowhere near the level it is today. But we face this challenge that kids today will be born, will live and die and will have never seen the stars. The stars are part of our heritage, guys. Doesn't matter where you come from in the world. All of human race has sat around campfires looking up at the stars, telling stories about where we come. And as light pollution encroaches, Day by day, it gets brighter and drowns out the stars until there is nothing left. So I really want to talk about how you guys can get into it. Um, I just want to quickly share some of the stuff that I've been doing um, so you have an idea of the artwork that I create. Um, so I create paintings sort of like this in a way to really inspire people. Anyway, on to the talk. Uh, how to start in Psycoms and dominate social media. I hope you guys... Uh, I'm just going to go as quickly as possible. So number one, we're going to start with the basics. All right, guys, finding your purpose, but also your niche. You know, my purpose is to connect people to the stars. And, you know, but, you know, your purpose might be to help people get into, you know, get into the actual education side. Some people's might be to encourage people, um, you know, to connect with other people around the world. You know, some people are just fascinated with the survival of the human race. But whatever it is, the thread of your excitement, you need to have the thing that gets you out of bed every day and also that your audience can connect with. Number two, and I know this sounds really basic, but is be okay with showing your face. Humans need human connection. And it feels weird when you start getting up on camera and talking and all of that stuff. And it's okay because you know what? It's just unfamiliar when it starts. I promise you, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Number three, I've got create consistent and great content. Now I know that that sounds really obvious, but people like to follow people where they know what they're getting. They know what they're going to be filling their feed with. So, you know, find a thing that you're really enjoying and just stick, you know, stick with it. Try and find iterations. So whether it's, you know, for instance, Kirsten does amazing TikToks on explaining different things in astrophysics, mm -hmm. cosmology, um, and all of those different areas of, of science. 
So find something consistent. And as far as creating great content, look for, um, you know, look at other accounts that are doing really well. They're out there. There are so many that you can get hold of. Um, Gary Vee always talks about this amazing method called the 10-10 rule, right? Create 10 pieces of content, but spend 10 hours on a platform. Once you've done that, you are almost guaranteed to understand like how to produce certain things and what does well and what doesn't work well. But be conscious and aware as you go through things. You know, If you're on TikTok, for instance, and you're scrolling by, take a mental note, like, why have I scrolled past this thing? Or why has this stuck me? You know, find some, you know, find the essence of each platform. Okay, so another thing is timing your posts well, depending on where you are aiming for. So what you need to do is if you're, for instance, focusing on a US market and it's a platform like Reddit, you know, you want Reddit has a, a long life cycle that spans 24 hours. So you want to be posting very early in the morning in New York time so that you get the full time frame throughout the day. If you're in Instagram, people are posting and going on Instagram in the very early mornings when they get out of bed. So depending on what country you're targeting, you know, do AM or when they get home from work, five or 6 PM, depending on your locality. Right. And next thing is just it's obvious, right? But be social guys, get in there, chat, respond to comments, the whole point of it being called social media is because it's meant to be social. It's not a one-way stream. It's meant to be two ways. Create the sense of community because this is all about bringing people together. You know, and, and the thing is that my purpose is to bring people closer to the stars, but I can't do it alone. In fact, none of them, everybody on this in this uh, stream, we all need you guys to get involved. This isn't a one man army or a 10 man army. This isn't something that we can solve with just 30 people. We need everybody watching to start communicating science, as long as it's what you're passionate about, of course. All right. Okay. So, number two, I'm going to go talking about tips on going viral. I know this is an, a, a bit of a black box and it depends on what platform you're on. Okay. So, uh, number one, I'm going to be talking about Instagram, okay, and creating collaborations. It's very difficult. Uh, as time goes on throughout a social media platform, it becomes harder and harder to create content that just or organically takes off. And that's why I really recommend creating collaborations with different people. Get someone, if you're creating a page, get someone who's got a similar page, maybe in a different area. So for instance, I'm a space artist. I'll work with astrophotographers or I might work with science news companies or something like that pages that are maybe similar size or a little bigger or a little smaller and we will help share and promote each other's content and it's literally a case of hey I really appreciate what you're doing I wanted to ask you know would you you know could I share some of your content would you share some of mine let's work together to spread the news of what we're going to do and that's a really really amazing way to grow your audience because ultimately even if you have the world's best message it's not going to go anywhere if you can't get it out to the people. So that's why it's really important to collaborate. Okay, so the next one I'm going to talk about is Reels on Instagram. I actually don't have this feature yet, but for those that do, it is Instagram's favorite thing. If you create a Reel, and sometimes you can create your TikToks and just post them onto Reels, it allows, you know, it, Instagram will give you in, uh, favorability of content and it will put it in front of so many more people. And imagine, the amount of people that you can reach with that type of content. And the other thing is Instagram pods. It's a little bit like a, a collaboration, but instead of just having a one-on-one, -on -one, often you can create, you know, you, you can ask around or create your own group of people that help support or even give you feedback on your content. Um, we call them Instagram pods. I'm sure everyone has a slightly different name for it. Okay, quickly on to Twitter. Twitter is all about creating resharable content. Now Generally speaking, people like to share things that make them inspired, that ultimately, and I know this sounds strange, but people want to share content that will make them look good, of course, because it's things that they're interested in or, you know, things that make them smile, like Bernie, Bernie Sanders in mittens. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> you know, it's like make stuff that really engages people. With Twitter, I found that when you're writing the captions, less is more if you can get it out in 10 words instead of 20 cut it down make it so it's instant creating uh you know and one thing i think is really important with twitter is images 
although it's a text-based platform, we are, as humans, we love and we gravitate to images, but Twitter does not allow you to choose how you crop it. So always crop it, add some filters, make it look beautiful. Um, but most importantly with Twitter, I would say more than any platform, it is the most social platform. You should be interacting. You should be creating and having engaging conversations. And honestly, that is the best way to create, you know, and go viral on Twitter. But of course, it's all well and good going viral on Twitter. If your feed looks very um, scattered, uh, when people do eventually come to your page, uh, you know, your um your channel to decide whether they want to follow you. If it's all over the place, often they choose not to follow. So may keep some level of consistency or at least, you know, for instance, I'm a space artist. I make sure that there's plenty, you know, I'm regularly posting space art. So even if I've got a few posts that aren't that, people know what they're getting because they can see it within within the, the stuff. Uh, the next thing is Facebook. I don't spend a great deal on Facebook. Uh, I have a big community there, but it's always, always favorable for videos. And ironically, the best videos that go well on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook happen to be TikTok videos because the formula for TikTok works on every single platform. So if I, even though, uh, you know, it does take time to get used to TikTok, I highly recommend it. At first, it might seem a bit, oh God, what's going on? Um, but as the algorithm le learns about what kind of specific things you're into, it delivers content that suits you. So TikTok, creating the viral video formula. So as Kirsten already said, shorter is better. Keep it succinct and to the point. Creating excitement or some suspense is absolutely critical really early on. And that could just be done by a, a text caption or a title saying, hey, wait till you see the end. Um, you know, for instance, I might do uh, a process video where I show all the different steps and then we'll have a dramatic pause and then the reveal. And often just adding a dramatic pause before the reveal creates that ta-da moment. And that's kind of actually a perfect way of making sure that your TikToks go viral. I'm really fortunate that I've got uh, a video that's gone over, been viewed by over 1.2 million people, which absolutely blows my mind that we can get space content in front of that many people. It's incredible. And the interesting thing about TikTok is you can link your Instagram account um, to it. And you, I've actually grown my Instagram account more through TikTok than almost any other platform. So it does pay to go out there. Now, here's the thing with TikTok. Don't expect to go viral. I went through uh, Kirsten's feed just before I came on here. Her first video has about 600 views. Do not feel like you have to get thousands when you start. It absolutely grows and builds over time. So, you know, and just to make a point, two videos ago, Kirsten did a, a, a talk on this cosmic microwave background, and that has seen over 160,000 views. It takes time, just be consistent and just keep at it. Now, lastly, I just want to quickly touch on Reddit. It is an interesting platform, but it is ultimately dominated by good headlines and good timing and and you know viral content i always recommend and i know this sounds strange but having curiosity and like numbers listed in the header is a key way to make sure it goes well um anyway i'm going to close off now as uh, i've gone through everything i've tried to do it as quickly as possible there is so much more content um but if you guys have any specific questions, I will be happy to answer them. And hopefully this helps. And actually, I think there was just three last things I do want to say, you know. Firstly, don't be scared of messing up. You know, it is required. Just view them as lessons and, you know, not mistakes. This is part of a journey. Number two, don't stop yourself doing psychoms because someone else is doing it. And, you know, maybe you don't have, you know, specific levels of education. Obviously, always make sure you fact check. But ultimately, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm an artist. I don't have a... I studied engineering not science as such um but there's room for everybody you know sometimes the the message that you might bring might land better than someone else who you know is more in the academic side of things you know there is room for everyone and the, the third thing and i already said this don't expect to go viral immediately it takes time it takes persistence it will pay off and just give yourself permission to give it a go because i promise you it's so so rewarding Thank you so much, guys. I really hope you enjoyed that.
No, I enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody at home did as well. That was just phenomenal. And honestly, I took a couple of notes there myself. Um, <laughs> something that I, I, I think it's, it's so amazing because, you know, people are always seeing other people succeeding on social media and they never really have, you know, a mentor or somebody they can look to in the previous generation and say, hey, you know, how did you do that? How did you manage that? And uh, I really appreciate you actually, you know, laying down a simple set of rules for people to follow some advice. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it, Kobe. <laughs> thank you. All right. Our final spotlight talk is going to be given by Lee Giat, who I had the pleasure of meeting with Ron, uh, actually, at the launch of Space IL's first Barry ship mission in Cape Canaveral a couple of years ago. Now, Lee is a filmmaker, a pilot, astronomer, brilliant science communicator who is soon going to embark on a journey to bring science uh, to communities all around Central and South America. But I'll let him tell you about that. Lee, take it away. Hey, Kobe. First of all, um, thank you for having me. And um, it's, a, it's such an honor to be on a panel with uh, such amazing people um, in SciComm as well and uh, that are doing it in, in amazing ways that, you know, is pretty new. Uh, TikTok is not that old. So um, the fact that you know, everyone's figuring it out and, and um, I guess communicating science in such a brilliant way so quickly is uh, truly inspiring. So um, yeah, and, and I did meet Kobe and Ron recently. Um, well, I guess that was 2019, but that was a lot of fun. So thank you for having me. I'm actually Israeli. So this is a really cool kind of full circle for me. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I want to talk about a little bit about how I got into science communication because that was never really uh, my intention growing up. And uh, I guess what I've learned throughout that process doing all these million different things. So I do have a PowerPoint. Um, I think Ron is controlling it. So Ron, if you want to put that up, I just shared my screen. There we go. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I want to talk about a little bit about how I got into SciComm and uh, how, um, uh, there we go. and a little bit about how, um, uh, well, just the things that I'm doing nowadays and, and how that kind of ties in. So uh, I actually grew up and my first real love and passion was uh, filmmaking. And I uh, continued to make short films and all that sort of stuff. These were some of the first um, that I've ever made. This was in 2005. That's me and my little brother. Um, and I've been making short films and I've always loved being creative and experimenting with the camera. You can see that UFO there is uh, in the foreground, making it look bigger. It's just a piece of paper that I printed out. Um, and obviously doing a low angle of my brother there makes him look 10 feet tall. Uh, so all that sort of stuff was fun. And, you know, I think every kid really, you know, gets into it nowadays. It's more TikTok and YouTubers and stuff like that. And um, it's fun to see everybody, you know, experiment when they're younger and see where it takes them. Uh, so that was kind of my thing, but it stuck with me. I've always been into film. Uh, but something that's been a constant in my life, too, is aviation. Uh, my dad was a flight instructor with over 25,000 hours, um, and he taught me how to fly since I was a baby. Um, and, you know, I learned to drive before I learned to fly. And uh, I continue to fly. I fly. I've flown every week since I became uh, a private pilot, uh, what was it now, like five years ago. Um, and my dad actually... Uh, did a lot of really cool stuff in his career. Uh, he, uh, uh, in the later years of, in the most recent years, he, he's been a, a, an aid relief pilot for uh, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, a lot of the Caribbean countries and a little bit of South America too, uh, for things like hurricanes. Uh, I grew up in Miami, that's where, where he lives. And I uh, am here in Jacksonville for school and for work, uh, which is a little bit more north of Miami. But, um, you know, we know hurricanes, we know how devastating it could be, how it can hurt your economy and, and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, I've been able to join him on some of these flights to uh, the Bahamas, to Puerto Rico, to Cuba, um, just to see what's going on. And, uh, you know, you see how, uh, how much of, of a lack of infrastructure there is, especially for the young, the young ones, education, the, the very foundation of, of what a person is going to be. Um, and so that stuck with me, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but my role in, in science and in space uh, actually came from video production. I always thought, um, you know, I was a creative person, and that's where I was going to stick, and that's it. I failed algebra in high school. I failed calculus. I was talking to Ron about this, actually. I failed calculus nine times uh, throughout college, and I might have the world record. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, I didn't know that there was a place for me in science communication. And I like to think of science communication as, the, as that middle man between 
or woman, that middle section between the experts and the professors, you know, if you've ever had a professor or a teacher that you just can't understand because they're so advanced in their in their respective fields, and then people that don't know anything all the way up, you know, down to flat earthers. Um, and so, you know, science communication is that bridge to, to help everybody understand what's going on in um, the realms of STEM. And so I did a video production story. I was in a TV production club in high school, and I did a story on this observatory, specifically on that lady right there. Her name is Helen Tavara. She is an astronomer with SOFIA. It's an aircraft. It's a modified, I think it's a 747. Um, and uh, it's uh, uh, an observatory. It's called the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And she's flown on that multiple times. And now she's an astronomy teacher. She speaks like a million languages, an incredible inspiration, and one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. And um, after I filmed a little news piece, you know, at that observatory, the small humble observatory in South Florida, uh, I decided to come back and volunteer. And she showed me Jupiter through the, the tree line, you know, that dot right there, um, you know, in the sky. And I was blown away. And then I saw it through a telescope and, you know, I got hooked. So I became an amateur astronomer. Um, I, you know, a few years later, after volunteering for a number of years, uh, she certified me to continue teaching astronomy through um, the NASA Night Sky Network, which is a network of observatories that um, promote science communication. And um, I ended up teaching and doing um, presentations at the Brian Gooding Planetarium at the Museum of Science and History throughout college. Um, and that uh, it's the largest planetarium in the world that is a single lens planetarium, meaning it's one big projector. It's not like a bunch of, it's not like a, a ball with holes cut out of it. It's an actual video projector. So I made videos that were formatted for the planetarium, which was really cool. Um, and it was a lot of fun kind of blending that uh, craft of video and space. Um, I also got to speak at schools and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, that didn't really stop there. While I was in college, uh, I ended up applying for a video contest called the Student Astronaut Contest, um, hosted by one of the most legendary science communicators of our generation, Emily Calandrelli. Um, and I ended up winning that contest and going to Russia to train like a cosmonaut with her and for her TV show, Exploration Outer Space. This was in 2018. Um, and along with, uh, you know, doing all the amazing things that you can do in Star City, Russia, the centrifuge, learning how to fly a Soyuz, trying on uh, the spacesuits and eating astronaut food and all that sort of stuff. It was really cool to see, you know, real TV production and real science communication happening on a nationwide uh, and I guess worldwide uh, uh, basis. And it was it was awesome to be part of it. And so these days, Rub it in. Um, I actually run a company called. Uh, I think Ron was trying to pop in there. Ron, um, I said, is, rub, uh, rub, rub it in, rub it in, rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> he was yeah, he was a finalist, um, and I kicked his butt. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he was a finalist to to win that um, opportunity. But um, yeah, he'll he'll go next time. He'll go next time, um, or I'll take him myself if we have to. Eventually, I'll save up. Um, but I, I run a company called Flying Ostrich Media. That's my day job. Uh, we film a lot of commercials and all that sort of stuff, but um, we're shifting more toward aerospace specific videography. So uh, we film a lot of um, corporate stuff for, for aerospace companies, companies in, in STEM, um, and also sci-fi short films with the goal uh, for the company it, to make the first feature film on the surface of the moon. So some of you may notice that uh, moon guy there with the missile in his eye, uh, that is actually the first ever sci-fi movie uh, ever created by George Millet. It's a, a French film called A Trip to the Moon, uh, created in 1902. And uh, one of the major goals, I mean, as major as it can get, uh, goals for, for my personal goal for this company is to make uh, that movie on the surface of the moon about 100 years after it was created. Um, I mean, that's probably the coolest way to honor uh, science fiction um, and taking it to the next level, like making a movie on the surface of the moon in the, in the exact same fashion that it was created in 1902. So that's something, that's one of, uh, one of the things that I'm just thinking about logistically with uh, some of my colleagues um, and how we're gonna do that, depending on what the state of the world is and, and where technology stands. Um, but uh, the big thing that I'm working on right now with many amazing science communicators and professors and researchers throughout the world is PASSAGE, which stands for Providing Aid in Science for South America's General Education. Um, and actually, so this was initially going to be uh, just a surprise. 
uh, and just a really cool thing that that was going to happen, um, you know, and, you know, I, I never got to show this to my father because he passed away in August um, in a crash. And this, I guess, was my way of continuing what he started, you know, flying with him throughout Latin America and doing all of these flights um, and getting to see that part of the world and, and want, you know, his ability to help using his passion for aviation and me kind of taking that on. So he never got to to see this passage this passage project come into fruition, um, but nevertheless, it's it's going amazing. I'm super proud of our team, and and uh, we're doing so many things in in all different aspects of science communication. So what is passage? Passage is uh, a flight across Latin America. I'll be flying a PA32 uh, Piper Saratoga plane. Uh, it's like a small single engine cargo plane, and bringing. Uh, school supplies, STEM education resources, lab equipment, and all that sort of stuff to um, kids and uh, schools that need it most uh, throughout the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. And um, we are uh, we have a GoFundMe up that is uh, that has a goal of raising fifty thousand uh, dollars in these school supplies. That's going to go directly to these schools, and hopefully, if we exceed that goal, uh, we get to bring a fleet of aircraft to do this flight, not just one plane. Um, and so we, this was kind of my way of combining everything that I love and that I've been able to experience film, space and science and aviation. And so we're making a documentary film to raise awareness for these regions and hopefully get them the, the help that they need in the decades to come. Uh, we are bringing them um, STEM education resources to, to help their infrastructure, to help their communities and to help uh, the future of this part of the planet where science has practically forgotten about them. Um, and, you know, inspiring kids to become doctors and pilots and astronauts and agricultural engineers and everything in between. Uh, and this is just the start. This is just the work of a few dozen science communicators and seeing how far we can take this and how many people we can help. And so we do have a GoFundMe up. Uh, we are almost at our halfway point um, and the flight is set to depart um, in December. Um, and we need your help to raise our $50,000. So after the conference, um, visit the, the link is down there. Thank you, Ron, for putting that up. GoFundMe.com slash Passage Science. And we also have a website, PassageFlight.org. Um, and there's also a lot of cool, yeah, eat those, eat those STEM supplies to South America. Thanks, Ron. Um, but we have a lot of awesome rewards that you'll get as well for, for donating patches, T-shirts, all the way up to uh, joining us at Kennedy Space Center for the documentary premiere with many other science communicators. So um, definitely check that out. Check out the website. Here is the link right here. Um, and if you want to shoot me a message or have any questions, you can follow me on social media on Instagram and Twitter at Astro Director. And um, thank you so much, Kobe, again, for, for hosting this. Thank you to the Ramon Foundation. Thanks, Ron, for uh, taking charge at the StreamYard stuff that uh, not, of us, not a lot of us understand how it works, but great job as always. And um, thanks for having me, guys. Lee, it was an absolute pleasure to have you. I mean, to be honest, your story and, and the story of this project that you're doing, this passage project, is it's just fantastic. And the moment that I found out about it, all I've been trying to do is to see how I can help. So, so it really is a privilege. And I feel so lucky to be able to let you share your message. Um, and I really hope that, like you said, that everybody goes afterwards and, and has a look at the passage page. Um, and, you know, Ron has just chucked the website down here in the scroll, you can see it. Um, have, a, have a look, have a read. Uh, and, and if you can uh, throw a few dollars Lee's way, this project is going to be phenomenal and you'll be making a great difference in the world. Lee, thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you, Kobe. All right, um, we are running a little bit behind time, so uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, patience. We're going to now watch the second half of that video presentation, uh, Why SciComm? And right after that, we will move on to our second panel. I think it's important because Right now, we, we kind of live in a world where we are transformed by our technology, um, not just rocket launches and living in space, we have astronauts living in space, but also this very device that I'm using to record this video. These things allow for us to not only be more interconnected on this planet, but also advance more as a species through our medicine, through curing diseases. 
And that's so important and vital to human existence. I love science because it's like the language of nature. And I love being a science communicator because I get to share my passion, my love, my curiosity of science with others. You are the ones that have a platform and a voice to expand our knowledge and share that and share our passion and joy with others that might share the same things. They might be interested in science, technology, engineering, arts, math, STEAM, okay? We have that privilege to, you know, spark up that passion in others. And I think that is just such a blessing and I am truly honored. My whole life's mission is to helping people see the stars. I really want to inspire more people to take an interest in particular in the stars because, you know, I feel like our, the future of the human race is out there in the cosmos. We really need to focus on inspiring the next generation of scientists and you know, all these different people in STEAM and engineers and technologists. I'm um, really because I think it's all about helping make life better. I think science communication is more important now than ever. I think that we're in a critical point in terms of our generation and the next generation in terms of what our next step is. And I think that there's so much of an impact that we can continue to have and lead as long as we have more and more people sharing their passion and continuing the excitement about current missions and new missions so that we can see more and more things accomplished in the STEM industry. I started sharing my journey in the space field um, on Instagram and on social media in general, talking about science, talking about space and everything that uh, I was really passionate about. And one of the rewarding things about doing it was from all the people who started following me and told me that they got interested in science thanks to what I shared and students who decided to get into STEM or go to study aerospace engineering as well. Maybe they were afraid of taking that path before, but then they saw my story and they decided to try as well. Now, it drew me to science communication is I was really just asked to volunteer and, and to speak to my old fifth grade class. And it just felt so amazing to tell people about space. The little kids, their eyes lit up, they were asking questions, and it made me feel so surreal, so satisfied. It is so important that I've continued to do it. I left my job at NASA to become a full-time science communicator, a space educator, teaching people about the wonders of space exploration and its importance to us here on Earth. Science communication is a very important tool for advancement and the development of educational research and the science itself because it's going to build a new bridge for collaboration at national and international level which we support future space projects. So science communication is that, that bridge between the two extremes to help everybody understand what we're doing here and, and what we can do with this beautiful thing that is science. The more we get people excited, the quicker we will make discoveries that will change lives forever. What really got me intrigued was that I was able to take the complex research that uh, whether it's me or any of the researchers were doing and bringing that to the public, get them excited about what scientists are excited about, um, being able to, uh, to, to get them curious about what we are curious about space. Um, that really drew me to science communication. I also love being a science communicator because that imagination that drives the next step also really drives science communication. It's about getting other people inspired and excited about what's going on in science and space. I think science communication is a really important thing for us to focus on as we expand into space because we need to make sure that all of humanity goes as we do that. Science communication, in my view, is an integral part of the scientific method itself as it keeps us all transparent uh, to the public and it's the public that actually fund it. Good science communication also creates a positive feedback loop for society, in my opinion, uh, as more public interest leads to more pressure on political leaders, uh, which in turn leads to more uh, funding. And with more funding, we can actually do more science, which will then benefit society.
Um, I just wanted to thank all of the wonderful science communicators who appeared in that video. We're going to be making the full version available on the website in the coming days. And also, guys, if you've missed some parts of this stream, don't worry. It's all available online on Fun Fact Science, on Stardom, Explore Mars, and, of course, on the Ramon Foundation. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the next panel, uh, which I'm going to be moderating. First off, we have uh, Fraser Kane, the publisher of Universe Today and the co-host of Astronomy Cast podcast. We have Dr. Yaakov Simon, an astrophysicist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Kirsten Banks, an astrophysicist at, uh, sorry, a science communicator and galactic archaeologist at the University of New South Wales. Awesome title. Uh, Dr. Eloise Savans, a, a science communicator and astrophysicist at the University of Auckland. Uh, and of course, PhD candidate in particle cosmology, Sophia Gadnasa from UC Irvine. Uh, Thank you all so much for being here. So um, I, I wanted to ask you all uh, a few questions regarding how science can be made more accessible. I mean, there's a huge jump between the lab and the science that's done in academia and you know the information that actually gets passed down uh, to, to the general public. So uh, Fraser, if it's okay, I wanted to start with you. Um, I know that you've been in this industry a long time. Um, what What's... What, what do you think has changed since you first started Universe Today? Uh, what, what, what has changed in the world of science communication as you see it? I, I think the biggest thing is that uh, like the places where we used to get our news, like the NASA's and the research institutions and, and even the scientists themselves are discovering that they're able to reach out directly with the audience and connect with them and share the work they do. Uh, NASA is my biggest competitor. <laughs> and and they produce better videos, better uh, text, and and they have amazing podcasts and all kinds of stuff, and and they have the rockets. So it so I think our role is to provide aggregation and analysis, and to try to bring other sort of uh, integration to people that maybe they wouldn't get directly from any of the one official platform. So I think that's the biggest difference. In the, in the olden days, um, people thought they needed the media and now they don't need, they now understand they don't need the media and they can communicate directly. And so then it makes our job as media more complicated and we have to bring a higher game. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Yaakov, next question for you. I mean, with all of you know the media that, that we're trying to bring, uh, like Fraser said, you know, practically competing with NASA in order to get this information out there. But uh, NASA and the large majority of the information that's out there is being produced in English. So uh, being uh, an astrophysicist and uh, part-time science communicator and astrophotographer, let's just put it out there, um, here in, in Israel, do you think that non-native English speakers have uh, somewhat of a harder time accessing reliable information online or in general? Yeah, Kovi. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I definitely do, uh, although I can only attest to Hebrew speakers, of course, and mostly to the fields that I'm familiar with, physics and astronomy. There's just much less quality material in Hebrew, which is not very surprising given the number of Hebrew speakers around the world. Uh, and I think also that people in Israel may sometimes tend to dismiss this being a problem since English proficiency is fairly high in Israel. And if you know English, then it's definitely not a problem since there is a lot of great material in English. Um, however, there are specific groups like young children or more senior people, for example, who are not able to process information that is not in Hebrew, or at least not as comfortably and easily so. Just think about the, pe the people who read Wikipedia in Hebrew and how many of these will go to the English page if the Hebrew is not detailed enough. Some will, but many won't. So I think it's absolutely crucial to create popular science content in Hebrew. And I think it's happening as there are more and more individuals who are both passionate about science and about sharing it with their fellow Hebrew speakers through a variety of means like blogs, Facebook pages, videos, etc. There are also organizations that do this now with Little Big Science being a great example, which we'll hear more about in the next panel, I guess. Uh, personally, I think one front to make progress on this is updates from the front lines of research from the actual labs, uh, bringing the most recent and exciting discoveries to the people. And I think this is, in one sense, it's more challenging because it requires usually the people actually doing the science to do so. But it also has some opportunities because many agencies and institutions have these press releases 
uh, already written and um, accompanied by this great material. You just have to translate into Hebrew. I mean, you touched on a, a few really important points there, Yako. Thank you. Um, I mean, I guess I, I want to ask uh, Kirsten first. I want to ask you a question, then afterwards uh, ask Sophia. But, but Kirsten, uh, you know, on that topic of um, you know uh, language barriers, and, and I know, for example, with uh, Wikipedia pages existing in Hebrew, there are a lot of the times with with my students here in Israel that um, you know I can look up a page and all the information is there in an accessible way for me. But for my students, a lot of these pages don't exist. Um, do you do you feel like there are some communities uh, from your experience in Australia, some communities that are, that are kind of left behind when science communication happens mostly online? Absolutely. And a great example of that is this pandemic that we're going through right now and how important the science and the communication of the science of the vaccine and uh, there's just the science of just going and getting tested has been a real struggle in Australia for the minority communities that don't always speak English as their first language. So it's really important to be able to make our science communication accessible to everyone because we all need to understand science, move forward in this world. Unfortunately, I don't know a second language. I, I learned a little bit of Italian in high school, but I definitely haven't retained that. So I, I feel a bit not good enough when it comes to this global science communication, but we all do the best that we can. And that's why having people from all around the world who know different languages coming together to promote science and to communicate science is so, so important. It's, it's really, really true. And, and that's one of the reasons why I'm glad to have kind of brought together a group of people for this event who come from different places in the world to hear exactly these opinions. Um, so, so Sophia, a question to you and then afterwards we'll go to, uh, to Louise. Um, on, on the topic of, of uh, material that's not really communicated properly, I mean, your, your field is one that I find one of the most fascinating fields in, in astrophysics, I mean, if I'm allowed to say that cosmology is part of astrophysics without too many people getting upset, but <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to ask you, do you feel like there are, there are some issues where science communication has become mainstream in certain fields, but not necessarily other fields? Yeah, so that's actually a really good, um, a really good question. I find that like, as you had just mentioned, you know, cosmology and the universe is something that will obviously get a lot of attention because it's amazing. I mean, I just, I don't need to say much, like just if you look up at the universe, there's just so much, there's so much mystery. Um, I do find, for example, in the field of physics that in science communication, for example, condensed matter will get left out. And so, and there's a lot of cool stuff that we can learn about there. Like that's kind of where, um, where, you know, kind of uh, partly where sort of quantum computing and stuff like that lies. It goes in that direction. And so quantum computing gets a little bit of it, but then, but then the actual electronics part, which is where, you know, some of the stuff that condensed matter can give you, we don't get to learn about that that much because it's not pretty. I guess it's not um, it's not instantly appealing, and so people might lose that part of it. But I think that there are just a lot of people from all fields now starting to come together and start uh, bringing the science to the public in a way that's easier to understand. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I, I think you're right, um, and uh, Eloise, this is a question for you. I, I I think that as you know, as part of moving in the right direction and trying to get more people involved and to see the beauty of science. Um, I wanted to ask you something uh, about TikTok and the place that TikTok has. Uh, and, and Kirsten, if you have a comment about this afterwards, feel free to chime in because I know that you have an opinion on this. But um, I'm, I'm asking you this uh, uh, in the context of a video from uh, several months back, if you recall, of, uh, of a young woman who had asked a question on TikTok, totally innocently just asking about math because it was just legitimately something that she didn't understand. So. Uh, uh, if you wanted to, to comment on that and uh, the importance of TikTok, as you see it. Uh, Eloise, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so that's a very good point. And it, it's, a, it's a very good uh, exemplification of why we need more scientists on platforms that are not necessarily like 
for scientists and are for everyone uh, because uh, this young girl was asking very good questions that don't necessarily have actual answers because they were so basic in a way, so fundamental is the better word for it, that uh, um, not everyone agrees, you know, like where does maths come from? Is it something you discover? Is it something that you invent? These are kind of philosophical questions. And people were trashing her in the comments because, you know, internalized misogyny and she was putting on a on her makeup and she's a, a young teenage woman. So uh, it was really good to be able to chime in and be like, hey, I'm a scientist and I don't know all of the answers to all of these questions, but here is something to put you, you know, on the right track and to start asking more questions. Uh, I think it's it's really good when we have personalities like we have in this panel uh, and beyond, you know, on Twitter, on uh, TikTok, on other forms of uh, social media that um, that can show not just the science, but the humans behind the science and really connect with people, because essentially we're all people and we need to to connect on that on that basis as well. It, you're I totally right. agree. Sorry, go on. Sorry, just, just chiming in, because like that, that that moment on on social media earlier this well last year i guess wow uh was really pinnacle for showing that and it really annoys me and i'm so glad that you answered her eloise because your answer was so fantastic and because it really shows how science works that we don't always know the answer but this also goes to show that there are no stupid questions there are no dumb questions no matter what the gatekeepers think no matter what the gatekeepers want to tell you is a good question or a bad question because of often these dumb questions are the most interesting questions like where does maths come from even after all of that conversation i still don't know where maths comes from but i know it's useful <laughs> The people trashing her did not know the answers to her questions. That's for sure. I can promise you that. Exactly. They were just quotes and bros trying to sound clever. That was it. Yeah. Exactly. I, was, I was trying to think that if we had to, you know, ask a bunch of chads on the internet who were just, you know, harassing this poor young woman, like if they know the axioms that define a field of numbers, they'd be like just grunting at you. They have no idea, really. And, and I think What's that there's an axiom. Like, <laughs> an axiom. <laughs> I don't know. I forgot the moment I walked out of that exam. Um, <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to ask Fraser <laughs> um, on the topic on the topic of the way that science appears in social media. Um, when you see a sensationalized headline, uh, otherwise known as you know, clickbait, about a science related topic, um, how does that make you feel? What's your what's your gut reaction to that? They did a better job than me. Uh, you know, I could have I could have clickbaited a little harder. I think um, no, I like. The, the dirty secret of media, the dirty secret of, of publishing, et cetera, is that the title is half the of the effort of the article, and the other half is the actual article itself. It sucks, but if people aren't going to come in and read your stories, then there's no point to write them in the first place. So, so you have to walk that line. And in fact, that's the job that I do at Universe Today. If there's one job that I won't let anybody else touch, it's that I make all the titles for the whole website. And the reason is because you have to balance this along this knife's edge. You have to write something that's very compelling that makes people go, wow, that's kind of cool. I, I understand what the news is, but also not be factually, scientifically incorrect. And so you have to sort of walk that line. So I think that uh, in the beginning, people people definitely lean in towards the click baby side. But I think if you want to stick around for a long period of time, then you have to lean more towards being scientifically accurate and then as compelling as you can be. Hmm. I, I definitely hear what you're saying. And I think that it's, it's a dilemma that every science communicator and, and science enthusiast and scientist kind of comes up against when they think, you know, I want people to click on this and I want people to engage so that they can learn the real science. And they kind of have to just just twist and kind of lean into the clickbait, just just that small amount, so that it actually actually can get out there. Um, Jakob, I wanted to ask you, and and Sophia, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as well. Um, do you feel like maybe there needs to be some kind of focus on science communication in academia to get more people um, who you know might have a wider range of skills in in actually you know jumping through that hoop that Fraser spoke about? Yeah, I think this is a difficult question. Um, so I think, yeah, I think 
science communication is definitely getting more attention in academia, uh, but we also need more. Um, I think there are many more activities in recent years with both professors and students giving talks and engaging with people. I think there's also more understanding and cooperation from management, allocating resources and people. But I think we definitely still have some way to go. I think it's important to recognize that outreach is an essential mission for pe the people who are actually doing the science and try to address it on several different fronts. Uh, we have to introduce students to it pretty early and make it okay for them to dedicate some of their time to it if they want to, of course. Second, I think we should make logistics easy uh, for organizing events, for example, rather than difficult and tedious. And third, I think a person who is responsible for outreach in each academic unit is very helpful, be, be, he, be they a student or not. Um, it's Again, it's very helpful for different reasons. Uh, responsibility, continuance of effort, and uh, overview and management, and again, make, making logistics easier. Those are so, some good points. Uh, Sophia, do you have any anything to add? Yeah, so um, everything Yakov said, definitely. Um, additionally, I think that we would benefit from having like um, a science communic a science communication course for those students who want to do this, because, for example. Um, learning how to sensationalize a headline without going too far. These are things that are important. Um, how I can take, you know, um, a topic that is so full of like math and then turn it into just just take the concepts out and and show that to the public because that's the stuff that people really want to learn about. And this is it's a skill that you have to build. It's not easy. It's not easy to take the jargon and all the stuff that like like the type of language that you're used to speaking among your colleagues it's not easy to just take that and translate it to regular regular language and so i think we would definitely benefit from having more programs and you know even possibly like courses available for students who are interested in that for sure so something I wanted to uh, chime in with as well is uh, something that's not as discussed, I feel, especially within uh, within universities about this. It's, uh, it's the technical effort that it takes to make good content for the Internet um, and for wide audiences. And it's just like Sophia said, um, it's, you know, the skill to translate something that's really difficult and give people, um, you know, an, uh, some sort of instinct, some sort of concept of, of what this means. And that's really difficult to do that without jargon and, uh, and, and to do that for audiences that are not your colleagues. But even if you can already do that, if you're making videos, if you're making podcasts, if you're streaming, that's an array of technical skills and of time and effort if you're editing that takes away from your academic progress. And we have to recognize that. If we want more scientists to actually put in time and effort um, into the community, because that's what we need to do to, com to communicate and to connect with the community, it needs to be recognized by universities, it needs to be recognized by funding bodies, and we need to be given like collaborations with people uh, who do media, who, who do editing, who do video, who can really collaborate to bring that extra skill. We don't necessarily have time to develop or we just don't have time to edit a video in the middle of the week because we have, you know, science to do. So I think that's something we should really emphasize. It's partnering um, media and scientists within universities so that we can reach more people. I, I think that if I nodded as hard as I, you know, feel like I agree with you, my I, I would actually do some serious damage to my head. I I can't tell you enough how much I, I relate to that. Um, my frustration, you know, over the course of my degree, which I am in the sixth and final year of, um, ha, you know, there's there's been so many issues along the way and, and personal issues as well. But you know, the reality is that doing science communication work alongside of my degree is something that I've felt has been. Uh, a challenge and something that I've even had uh, uh, members of the senior faculty in the university say, well, maybe you should just, you know, stick to journalism or stick to that kind of work. Maybe those are the cards that God gave you. But I think that, that you're 100% right, that it needs to be something that's understood as a key important part that students, they can't just, you know, do the degree and then go to work or do the degree and then continue in academia. There needs to be kind of a, a, a window uh, as Kirsten might say, a diamond window or an arch window into the world of academia 
uh, for those outside. And uh, just following on from that and from what you were saying, Eloise, about all these different platforms and different forms of media that are being used, I wanted to ask you, Fraser, and, uh, and I know Kirsten as well, this is something that uh, is close to your heart, what, what do you feel about this kind of resurgence of the audio format of podcast? Why is it that we're seeing this pop up again? I know, Fraser, you have your astronomy cast with Dr. Pamela Gay and, and, and Kirsten. Uh, you also have an amazing, amazing podcast that everybody should listen to called The Scientist. Uh, I, mean, I don't think podcasting ever went away. I mean, I think my perspective is that it was invented like almost 20 years ago, maybe 16 years ago, I think. And it's just gone up and up and up. It's had points where really key podcasts have come out that people have, that have brought a lot of new people into the field, but it's kind of inevitable. Like, like it's, it's like listening to radio, but on your schedule. Like imagine if people like opened up books in front of you and they just turned the pages. And then if you turned away, they just kept turning pages, right? Like, like no other media should work this way. So podcasts are just a natural extension of this. And so it just feels like a normal, normal thing. Hmm. Kirsten, anything to add? I think the thing I like most about podcasts is that um, while I am a proponent for very short form media with TikTok, is that you have the ability and the flexibility to really disseminate the science and really go into detail. And people can exactly stop, pause, whenever they want, they can come back. They can either listen to five minutes and then feel like they're done with it, which makes me sad, but you know, that, that's fine. Consume the content how you want to. And I think podcasts really give you that flexibility to consume the content when you want to, for how long you want to as well. That's so true. It, it, it really is an amazing format that uh, Fraser, you, you're right that it never really went away. It kind of made this smooth, continuous transition from being something that you listen to in your car, maybe to something that now people are listening to on their phones. Uh, I, think, I think one, just one additional note is that the thing that I've been finding is that people have a lot more interest in much longer, in-depth, very in the weeds kind of episodes. So, so I find if I'll do a two hour interview with somebody about a very specific kind of cosmology, people will eat that up. They really like it. So I think that that what you're getting is people are realizing that we don't have to be completely generic and, and have to talk down to everybody. Instead, we can really drill down on a topic that people are excited. A smaller group of people are really excited about. Um, I listened to a machine learning podcast and it's like three hours long and absolutely fascinating. And that's the kind of stuff that I think there's actually not enough of in this world is long really nerdy, really down the rabbit hole kinds of conversations. So, so they don't have to be highly polished. They just have to be what a certain group of people really want to hear. I think you definitely have a point there. And uh, I mean, a, a podcast that I'd love to give a shout out to, even though they're not uh, in the conference tonight, is um, Astro Soundbites. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, there's a, a website called Astrobytes where they take new papers that are coming out of the world of astrophysics and they they summarize them in, in kind of short very accessible uh, articles and uh, astro sound bites is basically the same idea but it's uh, it's three graduate students who are actually doing that same thing and turning it into a podcast and so recently they had a series i think of three episodes where they did exactly what you're describing they they, they selected a target uh, and it was machine learning uh, and algorithms within the field of, of astrophysics and they just spoke only about that for three episodes and I guess it's a it's a quantity it's a quality over quantity thing, where they can say, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do it properly, we're going to get into the weeds and and ask the questions and ask, you know, uh, jumping back to what we were talking about before, Eloise, asking questions that some people might consider to be dumb questions, but there really are no dumb questions. Um, I I I feel like people misconstrue the the, the fine line between I guess uh, stupidity and ignorance. And there are very few stupid people in the world. I think a lot of people are just ignorant because they haven't been exposed to certain ideas. And I really think that's an important role for us as science communicators is to help people gain access to these ideas in an accessible way. Um, okay, um, I wanted to ask if each of you now could in 60 seconds summarize uh, what project you're most excited for. Now, this could be a project that you have that's up and coming and you wanna share with people. It could also be something that is a pipe dream for you guys and you just, you want to get there, but you're not actually sure if it's going to happen anytime soon. So uh, Kirsten, let's start with you and then we'll do Yakov after that. 
Cool. So I think my favorite thing that I'm excited for uh, is my PhD. So I'm one year into my PhD right now. I've got three more years left to go. So in about three and a half to four years time, I don't know how long it will be since uh, from submitting my thesis to becoming Dr. Kirsten Banks, but eventually I will be Dr. Kirsten Banks, or maybe I might change my Twitter profile to Dr. Astro Kirsten. We'll, we'll see. But I'm really excited for uh, what science I have in front of me and the research that I have in front of me, because the the main goal that I'm personally looking forward to in this big four year long journey is to create an accurate 3D map of our galaxy to try and understand more about the history and formation of the Milky Way and other galaxies and extend that out to other galaxies in the entire universe. So that's a, that's a pretty exciting moment for me. That's what I'm looking forward to most. That's incredibly exciting. And I really hope that you can find a way to fit your title as galactic archaeologist in that new Twitter handle that you end up picking up. Uh, Yaakov, uh, anything that you want to share with us as uh, something that you have in the works or something that you'd like to see happen? Yeah, so this is not anywhere near being in the works, but it's kind of a fantasy that I've been having for a while now. And so it's, it's I think it's pretty simple. And probably somebody thought about this before, but what, what I really wanted to do was take a, buy a van and put a telescope or a few in it and just drive around Israel and people and show people um, the moon and Jupiter and Saturn and get to, you know, we've been doing this in Tel Aviv with a telescope on the sidewalk for a while. And in the last few years in Jerusalem too, of course, you know about that, but I would really like to get to places far up north in Israel and in the South where people didn't maybe have the chance to try that. So maybe if one day I'll be uh, recruiting or asking for donations for an Astro van, which is a name that was suggested by my wife, uh, you'll hear about this. Astro van 2025, I'm excited for it. <laughs> All right, uh, Eloise. Right, so if we're sharing fantasies, I'm gonna share mine. Um, I really want, and don't steal my this idea, it's my idea. <laughs> I really want to write a book called It's Never Fucking Aliens. I don't know if I can swear, so I'm not going to do that. Um, because I'm on a mild crusade against the clickbaity people who use aliens everywhere. And if you don't know, uh, I study some of the most extreme objects in the universe. Uh, so like neutron stars, black holes, supernovae, massive stars. And like for some reason, people try to shoehorn aliens into into everything. And it drives me crazy because, frankly, the real like the most likely answer is so much more interesting. The universe is so much more creative than clickbait. And I want to write a book that basically debunks all of these areas where people have tried to shoehorn aliens for no reason and actually tell people about the awesomeness of the universe and how creative it gets oh that's amazing <laughs> no ron it couldn't be aliens I was actually maybe someday but not for these i can tell you that <laughs> i was actually in a talk the other day uh that was being given by brian metzger about a uh, fast radio burst frbs and he had a bunch of pictures up everywhere and each picture was like could it be this model could it be supernova could it be neutron star mergers could it be aliens and each one is like no time scale is wrong and it wouldn't be bright enough and this and that and then over the aliens like no it's never aliens <laughs> it's just every, every time there's a question it's like people try to shoot horn aliens there's there's someone who uh, uh, at harvard could avi loeb who's uh, very well known for trying to shoot horn aliens into everything including frbs uh, although it's not his field i'll say that uh, and he um he was uh, trying to push that for omur mm -hmm. and uh, and i was like oh that's a uh, very weird why would you do that and then i realized it was uh, like six months ago that um he has a book he has a book that just come out uh, about about just trying to to explain it with aliens so yes so for capitalism and uh, and science please don't mix the two it's a, it's a it's a fine line indeed uh it's a fine line indeed between trying to draw people into science and uh and other things um okay fraser i'm really excited about the vera rubin telescope that's like it's all i can think about that is definitely 60 seconds or less what what objects <laughs> what objects are you uh, well, most excited for us to see with the I mean every, I, I want to know what the universe is doing when we when we weren't looking and Vera Rubin will tell us so I think if there's one and then I'm excited about the extremely large telescope and I'm also excited about the future release from Gaia and James Webb which is totally going to launch 
Yeah, the Just Wait, sorry, the James Webb Space mm -hmm. Telescope uh, yeah. is definitely launching. Yeah, but the one that I'm just like, I've like, like, and I am not like new to, like I've been just, uh, just fanboying over Vera Rubin Telescope <laughs> for a decade now. I'm so excited about this observatory. So yeah, that's what I'm, I have no involvement, no inter, this is, they're not paying me to market them. I just cannot wait for this telescope to show up and start doing some incredible science. I'm very excited for it too. Um, okay, Sophia? Okay, so I have um, two things. Um, one is my PhD. So um, I'm in my fourth year and I'm starting to, I, I've been studying dark matter. So if you know me on social media, you'll know me by my dark matter <laughs> tweets and, and uh, things that I talk about. But we've thrown in black holes as well. And so I'm gonna be using black, um, dark matter to explain supermassive black holes. Um, and these are basically the giant black holes that we have in the center of every large galaxy, including our own, which we can't really explain in the same way that you can exp explain like a stellar mass black hole, which just, you know, it's, it's basically the death of the star and, you know, you're left with this black hole. But one that's a billion times the mass of the sun, not so much. <laughs> and then on the other side, my science communication side, because both things are very important to me. Um, I'm definitely doing videos. I'm looking, I, I want to host a TV show, obviously, about, <laughs> about space, because I love talking about this stuff, um, you know, who, like, and, and, um, and that's, that's kind of uh, one thing that I'm working on as well, is a little series with a friend of mine. And so um, stay tuned for that. Wow, amazing. Um, sorry, I lost you guys there for a second. But I, I think that having all of you guys here uh, all of you guys and girls here and talking about these topics, I think is really something important for us to keep doing. And we've been running behind schedule tonight. Uh, we've had a couple of technical difficulties along the way, and I wish that we could keep talking about this forever. Um, but I'm going to have to wrap it up now. So uh, if there are any last uh, messages that, that, that you all have about uh, places where people can find you online uh, or, you know, famous last words that you want to give to wrap up uh, this panel session, um, Let's do in the reverse order that we just did. So Sophia, Fraser, uh, Eloise, Yakov, and Kirsten. I hope I got that right. Um, okay, so uh, for me, you can find me at Astro Particle, at, at Astro Particle everywhere. Um, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. I'm even on TikTok. Um, less active there at the moment because um, school is what it is, and so I have to put that first. But uh, that's you can catch me there and. Um, I have to, I, since, since someone did, you know, since Fraser mentioned Vera Rubin and she's uh, literally like my favorite astronomer ever because she's the reason why I do what I do. Um, I want to leave you with a quote from her and, and it goes like this. Um, okay. Don't look, don't shoot for the stars. We already know what's there. Aim for the space in between because that's where the real mystery lies. And that is why I study dark matter. The, and that is why I study dark matter part is not the quote. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we should just end the entire event right there and then. Wow. Um, amazing. <laughs> uh, Fraser. Uh, well, you can find me at universetoday.com uh, and universe today on all the things, um, except TikTok. I'm clearly behind the behind the uh, the times on that one, um, and of course you can listen to Astronomy Cast, where I have been getting an education in astronomy from Dr. Pamela Gay for the last 15 years. So you should definitely check that out. Amazing. I also haven't yet crossed to the dark side of TikTok yet, but I, I'm getting close. <laughs> um, Eloise. I'm muting myself, sorry. Uh, you can find me at uh, Sidonahi. Sorry that it's so hard to pronounce and write. Uh, I found that name when I was a teenager and didn't want people to find me, which is very awkward these days, um, both on uh, Twitter and, and TikTok and other places, I'm sure, and uh, hfstevens.com. So H for Eloise, F for Fanny, my real name, and Stevens, my name, dot com uh, for most of everything. You can find my free graphics, my, my, my science, my science community, there. And if you need me to talk to a school or an event that you're doing, you'll find my email address there as well. If, if, if you want to, if you want me for, for an event like that, I, I am free. <laughs> I just want to talk to people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Jakob? You should have ended with me. I don't think you can find me online. So maybe on the street with a telescope and one day in the Astrovan, if all goes well. 
So Astro Event 2020 and uh, Dr. Simon on archive for those uh, who are looking for papers on archive. Uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, okay, great. And it was really uh, great being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, Kirsten, and I guess that me. Yes. So uh, you can find me at Astro. Oh no, I, the things are backwards. Astro Kirsten, right there. <laughs> you can find me at Astro Kirsten on all the social medias. Uh, Twitter and TikTok is where I'm most active. I'm also on Instagram um, and and Facebook too, but you, nah, don't really do much on those those two. But uh, if you like short, fun content about space and science, follow me at Astro Kirsten on TikTok and Twitter, and I'll see you there. Amazing. Thank you, Kirsten. And and thank you to all of you. Uh, this has been wonderful. I wish we could do this for longer, but unfortunately, we're limited on time. Um, so I'm going to have to let you go. Uh, thank you again for uh, taking the time out to uh, participate in uh, Ramon's SciCom uh, 2021. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> All right, um, I would now like to introduce Hilly Shapiro uh, for the third and final panel. Um, this panel is going to be discussing uh, outreach programs, you know, STEM, and uh, STEAM, I should say, initiatives, and how to actually kickstart uh, your programs. Uh, Hilly, over to you. Hi, hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good noon, good evening, or good night, depending on uh, where you're in and uh, join us from. I'm Hilly Shapiro. I'm a former educational volunteer manager uh, at Space AL. I'm glad to be here tonight with you and host this panel. Uh, as Kobe said, STEAM in in initiative kickstarting your outreach programs. I'm happy to present our guest uh, on the panel, Yumiran Misan, a CEO of Little Big Science. Um, Dr. Graham Lau, a research in investigator, Bloom Marvel Space Institute of Science. Michal Zisu, an architect, an architect and uh, founder of Zisu. Um, Lee, Lee is, is not here. Yumna Majid, a space educator and aspiring astronaut. And Janet Ivey creator and CEO of Janet's Planet. Hmm. Though we can't hear you, I'm sure everyone is applauding them because they deserve it. Each one of our, our panel members founded an amazing program in the field of science communication. So Michal, let's start with you. As an arch architect, what motivates you to think about space? Well, first of all, I'm so happy to, to be here and uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, what motivated me to, to, to get into space, I mean, I, I kind of stumbled upon the industry and I learned, first of all, that there's a bunch of people who are dreamers um, and they are all um, positive people that are looking for ways to improve the world and our future. So I love that. Um, and for me personally, as an architect, I learned that here on earth it's very hard uh, sometimes for us to imagine change and space is an amazing opportunity to think about everything that we know all the building blocks completely from scratch um, to think about what we need that will fit the needs of people today of diverse people um, and, and i think i find space as a way to kind of transform the way we think from problems or problem solving mode on Earth to actually um, uh, opportunities in space. So for me, um, um, space is kind of a three three way opportunity. One is really awesome, so I just love it. But also, um, it's uh, it's it's a way to think about how our future will be in space and in the industry, and how can we um, live in space on the International Space Station, on the moon, on Mars, but also just as a way of creative thinking um, to solve problems in a different way. So for me, I really enjoy um, thinking and learning and researching and working uh, and designing about uh, like habitats in space and life in space in general. So that's kind of my two cents on why I love space. <laughs> 
Amazing. Um, for those of us who doesn't know um, Viso, can you tell us a little bit about your program and uh, what what have you found uh, be the most difficult part of design for environments in space? Well, Ziso is my studio. It's not uh, an actual program. It's It started as an architecture studio where I wanted to um, design and research um, the, the relationship between architecture and diversity or human equality. And right now I'm working on the intersection of architecture, innovation, diversity, and space. And what we are doing is we are um, doing projects and researching Um, habitats and habitabilities on um, the moon or Mars. Uh, we're also looking into creating a new set of building blocks uh, for architecture, for space. Um, for example, the International Space Station, people don't walk there, they float. And when they move from one space in the station to another, the, the dimension that is important is not their height, but their width. Um, so that's completely different um, set of, of rules. Um, also, there is no such thing as ceiling or floor. So everything we have to kind of start from scratch. And in, on every celestial body, we have different um, um, uh, temperatures, different gravity. So, so everywhere we look, uh, we have to think about things uh, completely differently. Um, but I also um, founded uh, Mars is More, which is a platform that is still in the making uh, for talking about space um, and kind of sharing ideas. I feel that today uh, people, a lot of people, especially younger people, are kind of scared or shy to share crazy ideas. And I feel like maybe people should get uh, more comfortable and kind of um, training that muscle to share their thoughts and share their ideas without being scared to be looked at um, in, a, in a funny way. So that's another thing. And the third thing I do is I, um, I work a lot in the uh, STEAM uh, mentoring, uh, public speaking. I work with um, Space for Women initiative by the UN Outer uh, Space, uh, Office of Outer Space Affairs. Uh, and I do a weekly show. I'm a part of a team that does a weekly show every, every Saturday uh, talking about different aspects of space and different aspects of diversity in space. Uh, and, and I really enjoy talking to younger people and specifically younger women and girls about how can they kind of walk and, and find their path in this industry because really I, I don't come from a scientific background and I really think that right now in space this is the perfect time that um, people from all different backgrounds can kind of find their own way and their own path in the industry because from, from learning from what happened here on earth when there weren't a lot of um, uh, diversity, there wasn't a lot of diversity from the planner side and the designer side, we need as, as many different perspectives as possible in order to create um, uh, a good and diverse and sustainable future um, in space. Wow, that sounds amazing. Uh, thank you, Michal. Um, Yumna, how about you? you? Have you always aspired to be an astronaut? Um, yes, I was always, uh, this, there was something uh, within me that always wanted to become an astronaut. Uh, being a child, I had this thought that every human living on planet Earth can get a plane and see what's in the Earth, but a very few human beings can see how Earth looks from outside and what's outside this sky and what's outside the boundary uh, across the atmosphere and stratosphere what what is this uh, and all the little news on television and newspapers about astronomy and space technology because pakistan is not uh, so successful in uh, space industry we are, we are far behind as compared to the others unfortunately so there were a very few resources for me to learn and uh, i think that's what amplified my curiosity that i wanted to know more and more amazing um how did you start exploration and Tell us a little bit about it and um, what sure. you have planned for its future. Yeah, so uh, 
as I said, I had a very few resources. So uh, in my teenage, when I got a computer and internet at my place, I started uh, looking up for resources on the internet that how I can bring astronomy to my country. Uh, because I was the student who was always mocked uh, in the class by friends and in the family that you want to become an astronaut or oh, you are an alien and this thing never existed. Moon landings are fakes and a lot of discouragement was faced by me. But I looked up on internet that how I can bring astronomy in my community and I came across a few amazing international space educational organizations. But they had this age limit that you can join them as a volunteer or a student ambassador uh, when you turn 18. So I think when I found them, I was around uh, 16 or 17. I waited for a few years and then I signed up as a volunteer or a student ambassador to those organizations. In the beginning, it was very difficult. Uh, here in Pakistan, schools were not willing to teach this subject to their students. And I used to go there and insist them that I am offering this service for free. Uh, let me just debunk the space myths, uh, which were already mentioned in their science books. Um, another hurdle was my own medical career. Uh, I'm a medical lab technologist, recently graduated. Uh, so over here, medical is considered a prestigious profession, a medical sciences. So schools used to claim that you yourself are a medical student, but you want to teach astronomy, uh, which has no, uh, you can say no career in Pakistan. So there were a lot of hurdles uh, which were faced, but uh, then I applied to a few competitions, uh, which were again by amazing international organization. And I got a telescope, which is signed by astronaut Scott Kelly. And that is when schools started realizing uh, that, okay, this is worth it. And this is something which is very difficult to uh, source in Pakistan. We don't have telescope manufacturing companies over here. So I used to bring my, get my telescope at different schools and show sun uh, to the kids, moon sometimes, because schools are usually in the morning time. So it's, uh, Difficult to get them for night sky observation. Uh, but yeah, that, that's how I started. And currently I am building more stronger partnerships. I am offering uh, online sessions. It is very difficult during pandemic uh, because astronomy in space, it's, it's an astronomy especially is an observational science. So no matter what I do, I cannot bring stars and moons in my classroom. So I always use art vector, but in all, on online sessions, it's very difficult for me. So I'm trying to make it more attractive and engaging for students by inviting some astronauts or some NASA employees or some people who are actually working in space sector, just like you guys. So that's very special for kids over here in Pakistan, again, because this is uh, not easily available for Pakistani kids. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to introducing uh, astronomy and space literature in my own language. So yeah, that's what currently I'm doing. And yes, I am trying to sneak into space sector by studying something related to space and genetics together. Sounds amazing. And in the name of all of us, we wish you Good luck in your journey to be an astronaut. I'm sure that everyone want to hear um, how it's going to go. Oh, and we have here Lee got in her. Hi, Lee. Hey, guys. Um, how are you? So, um, Yumiran, uh, for those of us who, who are not familiar with uh, Little Big Science, could you tell us in a 60 second what do you do? Um, basically, we aim to take uh, science, which is from all uh, all area of, science, of STEM, basically, uh, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and bring it to the public in a language that most people can relate and understand. 
uh, everyone who is uh, writing for us it has at least a master in uh, any field of STEM till uh, full professors and dean of faculties that we have. And everyone in my uh, projects are doing everything voluntarily. And of course, what's also very important is that we are doing something quite unique. We are actually talking to our followers and answering many, many questions every day, both private message and on comments. Uh, where everyone else basically online for, uh, are usually just posting something and let it go. Uh, we're not. We're answering questions. We're explaining things. Uh, we're elaborating, uh, which is very unique in uh, the ecosystem of the Internet. Sounds amazing. You work with quite a big range of volunteer science writer, as you said. How do you choose uh, the content that you publish? So, uh, first of all, of course, there are uh, things that uh, are relevant to uh, uh, um, whatever is going on in the world. Now everyone is talking about the COVID pandemic and, uh, of course, the vaccines that just got approved. Uh, so if there is something uh, relevant, we are uh, dealing and with this a lot. Uh, however, the uh, creators of the content themselves, the scientists, are the ones who are making the, de the decisions of what they want to uh, write about and how they want to do it. Uh, but we are providing them the, the overall structure and cover to do that, meaning that we have uh, people who will edit them, people who will give them criticism, like peer review, only like in a much smaller scale. We also have people who will design all the publication that goes along with this and time it and will manage it. So it's a whole system that basically gives every scientist who wants to write for us the opportunity to do, to do that. Thank you, um, Yumiran, and uh, keep doing such a valuable job. Uh, personally, I love a little bit uh, science. Thank you. Um, Janet, now you, yeah, in your space. You know, uh, A, I am so grateful to be here with all of you guys. Uh, Graham has actually talked to my students. Yumna and I met years ago, and she was like, what? What do you have? And we would I would send her things. She's even a, a won an award uh, with Raw Science Festival, a little video and movie that she made, uh, which was bringing down the stars to her students. Uh, Mikhail, I met this year. So I'm always encouraged that there are so many of us that are working towards this great thing called the education of the young so that in time, they become the scientists of tomorrow. So uh, Janet's Planet really flipped everything uh, back last spring and went online. Normally I'm out touring, doing a show uh, or doing a hands-on science camp. So uh, yeah, we're still offering all the classes free. So if you're interested, all you gotta do is go to janetsplanet.com and say, hey, I wanna join. But I'll show you just a few things again, because I'm hands-on. My, usually the, the age group I work with are between eight years old and 13. So we do everything from, we learn how to do origami. And that relates to how, how NASA is using origami to make solar sails for uh, telescopes so they can black out the light so they can see the movement of stars and planets more easily. We talk about building, you know, again, this is a ridiculous looking lunar lander, but if you look at some of the lunar lander designs, hey, who knows, it might be good science someday. And while it may look just like a crafting project to some, learning the basics of how things work uh, starts here. Everything from even making a straw rocket like that. Again, it gets kids excited like, how'd you do that? Because I'm at, at the younger age, sometimes science looks a lot like magic. And you're like, no, it is for real. So my passion and heart for a long time has just been, let's put some things. And here in the pandemic, we have done everything. It's like, you don't need any fancy materials. Hey, everybody should have a paper towel roll or a toilet paper towel roll. What do you got? What can we build out of this, this, some cups and stuff? And I guess just to conclude, because you guys have fantastic things to share. Lee, I met this year. I'm so impressed with what he's trying to do. 
mainly my thing to all my students is, you know what, we have, we have a couple of choices. We can say, oh, I don't know if it matters or touches my life, or we can kind of like build windmills and harness these winds of change because we're really, we're seeing, you know, educationally and evolutionarily, we are on this eve of this great transition. And it's like what I say to the kids all the time, you must first think it, say it, and dream it into being. And there's a shift of mind that's beginning, I think. And there, in a in a book called The Story of B, Daniel Quinn writes, the world will not be changed by old minds and new programs. The world will be changed by new minds and no programs. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't know. I'm an old mind. Like I'm a certain age. I am looking to these students that I am interacting with every day and going, I don't know. That could work. Maybe it could work. I don't believe that we ever have the power to tell an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, ah, that's like, well, you know, all the science on that and what we know now. No, I leave room for, yeah, I don't know. It's not proven yet. And as we heard beautiful people speak all throughout this afternoon, we're looking for the facts. We want, we want theories that eventually we can prove as facts. And that's how we advance science. But I want some audacious theories, kiddos. So start dreaming and experiencing that. And I truly have to say, I, my heart was moved when I heard Donald James, the former education director of NASA, uh, talk about his book and manners, because it's another thing. It's like, this is the generation. These are the kids that it's like, go and form the future and the, and the more beautiful, inclusive, equal, and wonderful place that we will eventually habitate on Mars and hopefully even here on Earth. So, you know, always as I'm working with kids, my biggest thing is, you know, get them and I like, you know, we've built something and we cheer them on. And then I tell them that, you know, the future is yours to write. You're going to be the ones that sing this song into the heart, turn this dark of night into the guiding light of tomorrow. And you're going to teach us how we grow jasmine in an audacious place. And so I'm looking forward to the dynamism that exists in the very, very young, because if they get excited about science now, we, I know, I have full faith they will produce great science tomorrow. That's amazing and such a great energy. <laughs> um, yeah, um, here it's a little late. Um, so Lee, um, that just joined us, um, we heard your story and and the passenger program and. We, uh, wanna, I want to ask you, um, what advice do you have to people or kids who want to combine science and arts or, or science and film? Um, now we know that arts, it's a, um, a part of the STEAM. Lee, yeah. Yes. Oh. Uh, first of all, how do I follow after Janet? Um, I mean, what an inspiration <laughs> and what a great science communicator. She's uh, so full of energy, and, and we have a private chat here um, for, for all of us. Oh, the truth is, I am like this all the time. There is no off button. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're all just, uh, we, we admire you so much, Janet. And um, Janet is actually a, a great supporter of Passage, and uh, we're sending a lot of her stuff to uh, kids in need later this year. Um, and so uh, Passage, uh, is a project that I guess we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, how do we, I guess, what would I say to, to kids that are, um, or, or anybody, I think, trying to, to combine uh, space or, and science and, and, you know, creative things like the arts. Um, and I guess it's just, and something that I think I've learned over the years is uh, do it the way you intend to do it, you know, don't try and follow a, a formula. There's, you know, I, cause I, I've done science shows in the past and I've done a lot of YouTube stuff and I've always tried to emulate like a Bill Nye or like a, or like a famous TikToker or something. And, and I think a lot of people kind of struggle to find their identity and their place in science by trying to emulate somebody else. Um, find what makes you unique. Uh, even, you know, being somebody who's not good at math, who failed calculus nine times, I'm so proud of that, actually, now that I say it, um, and, and somebody that grew up as a creative and a filmmaker, and recently, only in the past five or six years, joined into the space and science realm, uh, I've been able to merge the two and find my place, and now with Passage, I get to make a documentary film about 
uh, bringing STEM education resources to kids in need uh, while also raising awareness and making the world a better place. And uh, I think by finding something that you that you really have a passion for, and it doesn't have to be anything science related, it could be an art, it could be uh, like Kat earlier, who was in a, a previous panel, um, uh, she's an artist and now she's the highest uh, crowdfunded artist in the world and she makes space art. Uh, and so whatever it is that you're interested in, uh, just know there's a place for you in SciComm uh, and do it your way. You know, the internet is a very intimidating place. There's a lot of us, um, but we all do things our own way. We do things differently and just be proud of who you are and, and pursue it. Amazing advice. Um, Graham, hi, um, the last but not the least. Um, what brought you to the world of science and specifically astrobiology? Hmm, that's a huge question. Um, yeah. <laughs> geez, since I was a child, I, I've, I've been interested in bigger questions about who and what we are and about our place in the universe. And as, as a young kid, I, I love playing video games and, and reading comic books and, and watching things like Star Trek, The Next Generation and Star Wars. Science fiction inspired me to think philosophically and to think scientifically and, and to ask big questions about what more could be out there. What does it mean to be human? Uh, what is consciousness? What is life in the first place? There are so many deep questions that I wanted to be part of. I, I wanted to explore for myself, but also in the endeavor of science, the human endeavor of using this tool of science to try to figure out more about our place in the cosmos. And admittedly, when I went to college, I wasn't really sure what I was going to study because I, I was interested in so many different things. And so I started off with biology, and then I also decided to add in chemistry, and so I earned two degrees there. And then I was like, well, that's not enough. I need to study astrophysics, and so I spent a few years in astrophysics, and then finally earned a PhD in geology. Uh, but along that way, while I was exploring that science and learning more about research, more about things like extremophiles and the geology of our world, uh, the biology of life, the planets of our solar system, the stars in our galaxy, all of these things, those big questions started coming back to me. And I really got more and more interested in not only the philosophy of the science, but philosophy in general, and I, I also learned that there's a lot of people out there who are interested as well. A lot of people want to know, are, are we alone? Is there something else out there? What more awaits us in our near future? And I realized that I had some skill in sharing my knowledge with others and in joining in a, a greater conversation, a greater discussion with, with many people from many different backgrounds. And that kind of drove me towards becoming a communicator of science. And so that's that's very much what my career has ended up becoming. Now I'm, I'm involved in astrobiology. I'm also very much involved in in sharing science and trying to help young people as well get involved in this pursuit. And so it's a lot of fun for me to speak to various audiences from around the world. And I, and I love speaking to students, especially. Wow. Um, could you tell us um, about Blue Marble Space and what is your role there? Absolutely. I'm the director of communications and marketing for Blue Marble Space. So even though I have a PhD, I've also now started branching out into the business world. I've learned about nonprofit communications, doing marketing, doing social media engagement, website engagement, uh, email engagement, all of these kinds of things to, to build an audience around our organization. I am also, though, a research investigator with our research institution. But to answer the first part of your question, Blue Marble Space is a nonprofit. It was created by my friend and the CEO of the company named Sanjoy Sam. Sanjoy had written a paper back in 2009 uh, suggesting that we could, we could have one single flag to represent all of us when we go into space. So instead of having an American flag, an Israeli flag, a Russian flag, a Chinese flag on our, on our, our spacesuits, we could all wear one flag. And from, from that power of that idea of taking one flag into space, and he created an initiative called One Flag in Space, uh, that, that led Sanjoy to build Blue Marble Space as a nonprofit to engage with these ideas of space exploration, uh, sustainability, the future of our planet, the future of our species. And Blue Marble Space now serves kind of like an umbrella nonprofit corporation 
so that scientists who also want to get involved in leading nonprofit initiatives can do that through our organization. So we have something called SciWorthy. Uh, this is a website that publishes um, easy to read uh, uh, reviews of recent research, recent scientific research. Uh, we have Green Space, which is an indoor microgreen farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, we grow microgreens and sell those and use some of the money to fund education and to learn more about how plants are very important for humans going into space and going to Mars and other places. We have our, our research initiative, Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, where we have 63 research scientists, myself included, in our organization. And we also bring in a, a large number of interns every year. This past year, we had 66 interns in our Young Scientist program. Uh, I had 19 of them myself that I, I was helping to mentor and advise. Uh, and of those, I've had three of them continue on as visiting scholars now in our research institution. Uh, and so it's a lot of fun for me to, to help these young people to learn more about how to share science, to get involved in science, to get involved in astrobiology, and, and to share their passion as well. Um, wow. And how do you get involved in the University Rover Challenge? What is actually is it? Yeah, uh, the University Rover Challenge is a robotics competition for engineering students primarily, but also, also science students uh, at the undergraduate university level. Uh, each year we have 100 plus teams from many nations around the world apply to take part in this competition. A lot of them will use it as their capstone or, or their final undergraduate project. Some of the teams have only three people in them and some of the teams have 50 or more people in them and it's a very large university project. They will build Mars rovers, actual functional Mars rover robots. And then each year they bring them out to the desert in Utah for the final part of the competition. Uh, and I should mention, we, we, we do a down selection along the way. We do review uh, their designs and their process and, and make sure the engineering is sound to justify having them come to Utah for the competition. Of the teams that do come in the end for the competition, I, over the years I've seen some incredible engineering and science to, to complete the challenges we put forth to them. Things like taking tools to an astronaut in the field, using autonomous navigation uh, so the rovers can figure out where they're going on their own, uh, driving the rover up to a kilometer away and even out of sight of their communications. Uh, we give them a lot of really hard challenges, both science and engineering challenges, to reenact what it's like being on Mars. Uh, and some of these young students will likely build the Mars rovers uh, the Europa landers and Enceladus landers and Titan, Titan orbiters and landers of our future. And so it's just great for me as, as an astrobiologist to, to be part of this competition each year and to see this happening, to see these young engineers and scientists building these rovers at, at the undergraduate level that, that are, are very competitive uh, and just incredible robots. Wow, well, uh, sounds interesting challenge and... Uh wish you good luck and thank you so much. Um, this question uh, appeals to everyone. If you could carry uh, out one project with no limitation of budget, time, or resources, uh, what project it would be? Wow. It's like unlimited resources. It's like, I think we would, I would say, I would grab all of these people plus some of the others that have spoken today. <laughs> it's like, all right, guys, Lee, get that plane ready. We're about to make, we're going to make a stop in every place possible and take science there. Uh, that's what I would do. I would enlist every, every good hearted educator I know. Let's hop on Lee's plane and we would take science uh, to urban places, rural places, places all over the world and uh, put science in their hands. I mean, it's like there is something magical and you mentioned it while ago. There's something magical when you introduce a kid to an astronaut, somebody that's actually been to space, or you introduce them to an astrobiologist like, uh, you know, Graham Lau or an astronomer like Grant Harkness or, you know, any anybody you name any field. And it's like all of a sudden when somebody sees something, oh, I've never heard of that. That's in, that's interesting to me. Uh, those are the things that I think matter. So, yeah, I would I would coordinate a global effort and we would we would make education and science education the number one priority. If you want to give me that money, I'm totally fine. <laughs> I'll lead the charge today, people. <laughs> wow, I'm a little bit 
honored that Janet just said, yeah, whatever Lee's doing, let's just do that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's like yeah. after we go to after we go to where you want to go, then we'll just kind of continue the trip. How about that? Oh yeah, and and honestly, I mean, it's kind of in the works now, and, and it's kind of you know just a thought right now. But there is a plan to do a whole thing around the world, uh, maybe stopping by Yomna um, and maybe Israel as well. So uh, we'll definitely talk after passage. Passage is definitely um, an exciting thing that's happening, and and uh, you know we'll provide a lot of. Uh, uh, resources for kids to succeed in STEM. Um, but, you know, maybe we will do uh, a very low earth orbit, if you will. Um, so, yeah, unlimited resources. Yeah, I agree, Janet. If there's anybody that, you know, we can uh, <laughs> pay for it, that would be safe. <laughs> and, and, you know, and even further, it's like, how cool would it be to uh, take a few, you know, a few or a bunch of kids to space because I think at that moment when we saw them react to that overview effect it might really already when you hear an astronaut talk about it it sort of changes your whole um, consciousness imagine having a kid and kind of like having that through their eyes I still again my favorite people on the planet are between you know eight through 12 and only because it's like they're they're not necessarily have been told that it's not possible yet. I tell them again all the time, you know how you predict the future? You go out and create it. So yeah, we would we would take them to space. We would go and give them science. So yeah, Elon, if you're still on, <laughs> take your money and we'll do it. I was going to um, up Janet's and uh, Lee's uh, global efforts and take just everybody into space. I really think that for me personally, whenever I talk to people about space and they really don't understand how I'm even involved because I'm an architect, and after I just tell them a little bit about it, they're, they're all, 100% of them, 100% of the time, they're all fascinated about it. So it's really um, would be amazing to kind of bring space to everyone, first of all but also to really have people really go for, to space for an hour, maybe, uh, just to get that overview effect. Um, it's, it, it's interesting to bring kids there, but it's also maybe very interesting. I would, I would take world leaders, maybe, to see the Earth uh, without any borders. Maybe something will shift. Maybe we'll start thinking as a, as a unit. Um, so I, th I think that um, many people of all ages can benefit uh, from from uh, seeing seeing Earth from space, maybe just for for an hour. So that's what I would do. Maybe our friends at Virgin Orbit and Space Perspectives. It's like I see somebody just said, "All you got to do is buy eight billion tickets, and everybody gets to go." There we go. <laughs> Jane will go with you on Space Perspectives or Virgin Orbit, whichever you know, whichever wants to take us first, we'll go and take yep. and take everybody. Uh, that sounds like too much pollution. Uh, <laughs> like. Well, the idea is just up and down in her big, you know, kind of like oversized balloon. So maybe there wouldn't be so much of a carbon footprint there. You're talking about a lot of rockets. It's a lot of carbon footprint. True, true. <laughs> maybe we just like all head for Mars. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's that's um, solar powered rockets in the next few. We take all that money invested into solar powered rockets and just, uh, I, I don't know how that would work, but we'll see. Maybe we'll get those uh, EM engines that we were promised a few years ago. Uh, okay. Um, may I thank again to our guests in this uh, panel, Yumiran, Nissan, um, Dr. Graham Lau, Michal Ziso, Ligiat, Yumna Majit, and Janet Ivy. It was a pleasure to have you here and to learn from your experience and uh, stories. And um, I would like to invite uh, Kobe Rose to say a few closing words. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, um, I, I don't really have the words to describe how amazing uh, it's been. Uh, firstly, thank you, Hilly, and, and thank you to all the panelists um, from this panel and from the entire event and all the speakers and all the science communicators who, who sent me videos in advance. Uh, thank you all for your really just fascinating insights and, and sharing your story. I also have to give a huge thank you to uh, Ron and Melody at the Ramon Foundation for their constant support. A very special thank you to Wade Holler for building the website. And of course, 
to Ron Sparkman for basically being the glue that held this entire production together. Now, during the final preparations for today's event, there was a moment where I stopped and I kind of realized that four months ago, this conference was just an idea in my head. And it's been such an incredible journey to watch it become a reality, especially seeing so many people coming together from around the world to discuss the importance of science and, and how to make it accessible to the world. And to be honest, that's the one thing that I would implore everyone to take away from this conference, that we achieve so, so much more when we collaborate with other people from different backgrounds, people have different perspectives and different skill sets that they can bring to the table. Now, there were so many wonderful human beings who spoke today. And if you want to learn more about them, you can go to scicomcon.org for links to their social pages and to their websites. Again, that's scicom-con.org for links to all the social and all the pages. If this conference has also sparked an idea in your mind, if you're a science enthusiast or a communicator or an educator who just really wants to collaborate on something, don't hesitate to reach out, either on social or you can email us at space at ramonfoundation.org.il um, or reach out, as I said, through social media. And that's the best thing about this incredible community of science communicators. They're all down to earth people who at the end of the day, they really just wanna share their passion for space and for science with the world in any way they can. Uh, as some of you might uh, be familiar with Logic, the rapper said, how can sky be the limit when there are footprints on the moon? And, and I really hope that we can strive together to achieve great things. And with science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, hopefully we'll be able to inspire the next generation to learn, to educate, and to better. Thank you all so much for being here and have a wonderful night.